So I will call our meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. Um, and let's see, I've got so much in uh, in front of me. The first thing I do, I do, I think, is we'll ask the uh, members who are participating remotely to uh, identify themselves. Uh, this is Carrie Brown, District 3. Thank you. Uh, Sal Alfano, District 2. Great, thank you. Um, I'll review a little bit of the meeting logistics. Uh, anyone who is participating remo remotely, please change your uh, name display to indicate your first and last name on the screen so we have a record of who's participating in the meeting. Uh, anyone who wishes to address the council must be uh, recognized and... Uh, we would ask you to start by stating your name and where you live, keeping your comments to three minutes, and Councillor Bate will assist us in uh, keeping time. Um, if you're speaking about a specific agenda item, please keep your comments germane to the topic. Um, and you can be reeled in if you do not uh, keep to the topic. I would also... Uh, ask all members of the public to uh, adhere to the uh, city council rules of conduct uh, adopted at public meetings adopted May 11th, 2022, including uh, the rule that requires all members of the public in attendance to remain seated in one of the audience seats unless you're being, unless you're addressing the council. With that, uh, time to approve the agenda. Does anyone have any uh, requested changes to the agenda? All right, we are ready to go. The uh, next item on the agenda is general business and appearances. This is an op opportunity for any member of the public to uh, address the council on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. As with other items, we uh, the time limit for general business and appearance is, is two minutes or three minutes per person. And uh, I'll open the floor to people here in the room. Yes, sir. I'm Sydney Cushing. I'm actually your guys' water and sewer supervisor. And I came tonight just to kind of share a concern that a lot of my crew members and a lot of the public works garage expresses. And it's more of a change in our appearance and our staff and kind of what we've been doing. As you guys are aware, we've been operating short staff for a number of years now, and we always pull it together and kind of make the magic happen, but it comes at a huge cost to other divisions down there. For example, the water and sewer guys, it used to be more of a voluntary thing where we were relief support for winter operations. And now we're just part of winter operations. They're very dependent on us. And it's causing an increase in overtime, an increase in our workload. It's leading to a lot of burnout and added stress. And it's nothing that our guys aren't willing to sacrifice for the city because we all just do what it takes to keep us going. And we're happy to do so. And we know you're aware of this. It's just a concern because we don't see a whole lot of sustainable plans for a change in the future. And it makes us nervous because eventually we are going to be old men and we don't want to fail and not let you guys down. We want to be successful. It's kind of stressing the importance of bringing the street staff to full capacity and replacing the missing members. It's a huge cost to all of us missing those people. And I'm not naive to budget problems and the gap that's already in existence in happening this year. I'm just hoping that moving forward with budget talks that there could be a focus on finding that sustainable approach to not just bringing us back, but maybe even making us better. And then that goes into like our equipment. We've had equipment purchases deferred for a number of years now, and the effects are becoming apparent. 
when I first started Montpelier, it was a lot of pride in the fact that we had the best staff and the best equipment available. We're the capital. I was so, I still am very proud to work for the capital. I don't want to see our current trend carry to the point where we're no longer a leader of Vermont, but we become a follower. I want to set a precedence. Other towns should be looking to us for how we achieved the goals and how we managed to get through all of the tough times, which we've gotten through them. So we've had, we can pat ourselves on the back. We've pulled it together. And that again is coming at a cost to our equipment with the, with COVID and the flood, our equipment has gone, has really taken on extra work and it's shown extra wear. When I first started with Montpelier like nine years ago, we could have multiple snow events and our trucks did not break down. Now, when we have a major snow event, there's three to five trucks in the garage broke down. And what that leads to is they're borrowing like water department trucks. We used to be able to make it through if there was a water leak and a major storm event at the same time, it wasn't a big deal. We had equipment enough. Now, I'd be really nervous for a heavy snow event and a water leak simultaneously. We'll make the magic happen and we'll get through. It's going to come, it's going to take longer and it's going to stress the men more. And it's really because the equipment isn't there when it, it always was before. And I know you guys are not naive to this and I'm not trying to say you're not trying and you're not approaching. It's just having a sustainable plan for the future. How are we going to overcome what we've deferred? And I'm sure that questions may be asked, but I hope it's highlighted now the importance of asking that question. Mm -hmm. How are we going to catch up? Thank you. You're, Time is expired. That, that's thank, fine. Thank that's you. all I had to say. And thank, thank you for hearing me. We appreciate everything you do. Anybody else in the room? I have to stand to keep my back from dancing up. So I don't know if that exception was crafted into your carefully policy. Um, I want to support i mean he said it a lot nicer than i've said it for a few years now uh and he's doing it every day so i want to really commend his succinct we probably got a 200 million dollar deficit of infrastructure repairs that we have kicked down the road for too long and i don't understand all the implications of how many trucks are down and how long but this is the mismanagement that i've been crying out for a long time that we have just uh, ignored or swept under the rug. And right now all our sidewalks are covered with glare ice. The the snow hasn't been removed. Puddles everywhere, people with wet feet, you know, damaging their cars in the potholes. And you, you're just shifting costs by, and I, again, I'm gonna say fully fund public works. I don't know how many people that is, but that's better than hypothetical you know, replacing a fire chief when we don't need one right now, or not until, you know, we won't need one for a year. You know, we, we can get by without replacing the chief. You can put an interim chief to handle the legal obligation of health, et cetera. So same with the, the one police position, you know, to, to plan for contingencies or exceptional circumstances when we've got other backup in Capitol police and state is, is unreasonable right now. Public works is where the, I want to see them fully staffed so that we can measure them against a standard of what they're able to do and what they're not. And if they can't do it then, then we know we've got a different problem to address in the, in the way of leadership structure, compensation, whatever it is. But we're not going to know as long as we keep shortchanging public works, they're going to have an infinite reason, legitimate reason for not keeping up. And that not keeping up is what people are crying out about and people are getting hurt. You know, I mentioned the oil leaking from behind Unitarian church, you know, into the river. And I've seen no action to address it. No, no booms to absorb it. It's been going for days. You know, some, something's leaking oil, you know, somewhere in that black pipe going up school street and, the, the water leak over in front of MMR next to the Capitol. Uh, that's a, I forget who owns that building, the blue building, two doors. 
that water leak has got sheer ice across the sidewalk, two, three inches thick, you know, out into the street. And nobody's going to fix that. You know, how many times do I have to call it to your attention? What are we paying? How many hundred thousand dollar salaries for this kind of performance? You know. Thank you. Um, is there anybody else in the room who is looking to be recognized? And now I'll ask if there's anyone on uh, on Zoom who's looking to be recognized. Not seeing any hands. Yes, sir. Eric Chase, uh, worked for DPW for a little over nine and a half years. I mean, I wanna obviously second what Sid said. Um, the equipment is a huge part of what we do and and how we do that we have gotten by for a number of years very well um we need to be mindful of of where we're heading um you know everybody here these guys here burn alex and and everybody else at dpw put 110 percent into making the road safe, passable for the fire department, the police department. Um, you know, we're working as a team and we need to be mindful moving forward. So those services obviously don't slip in this, in, in this city. I mean, I grew up here, graduated from Montpelier high school. Um, we need to be looking forward to making those improvements to continue our level of service where obviously the residents want us to be at. So if everybody can be mindful of that, I think that's where we're looking forward. Okay. So, thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay. I am not seeing anybody else with hand raised. So I'm going to move to the consent agenda. Um, very short consent agenda. Is there a, a motion to approve the consent agenda? Is there a second? I'll second it. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Okay, we have adopted the consent agenda. Yes, Donna. Procedural. On the remote, just the very top of your head shows. Oh. You could tilt your... Let me I think just... people would like to see your face. Yeah, maybe, but uh... <laughs> let's just take a look. I want to see the face. There, that looks a little better. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Donna. Um, next up, we have uh, a charter change petition. Um, is there somebody here to talk about that? Yes. And as, as you step up here, I will open the public hearing on the uh, petition for a charter change. There. While they're setting that up, I'll just note, and maybe the city clerk can help me out here, that there are two ways charters can be changed. One, the city council initiates and places an article on the ballot, and that has one set of public hearing requirements. And the second is a petition to charter change, which is what these folks have brought in, and a slightly different set of public hearing requirements. So they're having their first this week, and the second will be next Thursday, right before your board of abatement meeting. Uh, and that will satisfy those requirements. And because 
um, because this is coming from a petition and not the city, then the petitioners will make the presentation as opposed to city officials. And this is on the agenda, on the on the ballot. It's just because the yes. requisite number of signatures have been uh, provided. Just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Does that sound good? I'm bringing a bit cold. Can you hear in the back? Great. We all good. Well, good evening, uh, Montpellier City Council. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I my name is Tom Proctor. I am the Housing Justice Organizer for Rights and Democracy, and I'll be talking today about the Just Cause Eviction Charter Change Petition. Um, I will warn you, I've got quite a lot written. I, I thought this was the, just the meeting to inform people about what is in the petition. Um, it's pretty detailed. So if you want me to cut to the chase a little bit, just let me know at any point and I will, I'll move it along. It, it would, we have a substantial agenda, so... If we can be expeditious, that would probably be appreciated. Okay. Uh, so just first off, I've been uh, working at Rights and Democracy as the housing justice organizer for about three years now. Um, this has put me very much in the front row of what is an escalating crisis in Vermont that's affecting a third of Vermonters and about 50% of Montpelier residents. One of the big reasons we are finding ourselves in a housing crisis, and there is many different reasons here, um, one is housing supply. You'll see in the graphic behind you, um, housing supply was, was pretty steady uh, in the 1990s. It dropped in the 2000s, and between 2010 and 2017, uh, for rented properties, uh, it dropped to just 0.3%. So only you know 0.3% of more houses came online in those seven years. Uh, we don't have the data right now for between 2017 and 2023. That should be coming out from the Vermont Housing Finance Agency at some point this year. They do these these uh, reports every five years. So um, the socio, uh, so the lack of availability has been compounded by the pandemic and climate migration. In 2021, for the first time in decades, you saw a net increase in people moving to Vermont to live in Vermont. Um, the socioeconomic makeup of those folks tended to be richer. It was post-pandemic, more people working on Zoom. Rather than live in New York City, rather than live in Boston, let's go to an idyllic place like Montpelier, Vermont. I can do my work anyway. And that, as a result, has risen the cost of housing in Vermont. Uh, um, it's It's gone up. An incredible amount, um, I believe 121% in the last couple of years um, in certain places around Vermont. Um, sorry, my statistics were wrong there. Uh, the price of a single family home rose more than 16% in 2021 to 382000 So to get on the housing ladder is really difficult, especially if you are a renter. So in short, we do not have enough available houses. We're not creating enough new housing and the demand is only getting higher. This has put an enormous financial strain on renters who are being priced out of a severely limited market and leading to mass evictions as landlords seek to find richer tenants. Um, the 2020 Vermont Housing Needs Assessment, written before the pandemic, had data showing that over half of renters in Vermont already had housing costs that consume more than 30% of their income, the standard for assessing affordability. Half of those paying above affordability rates pay 50% or more of their income on housing each month. And obviously this puts enormous economic strain on the rest of uh, the rest of our society, effectively, the rest of our community. Um, the current market conditions is incredibly hostile to renters, but it is a seller's market for landlords, which some have been quick to take advantage of with disastrous consequences for our tenants. With no risk of having the units filled due to outrageous demand, some landlords have been evicting their current tenants uh, to take advantage of the richer market or movement to the Airbnb market. Some landlords have seen their properties skyrocket in value and sold to out-of-state real estate investors uh, that have no knowledge or love for our communities and just wish to make a profit. And some landlords have been have seen an opportunity to rid themselves of quote unquote problematic tenants that have the audacity to complain about code violations or discrimination. The result of this has been an explosion in no cause evictions, a legal recourse for a landlord to rid themselves of a tenant, even if that tenant has done nothing wrong, and an option for any landlord can take when filing an eviction notice in Vermont. 
the difference between a landlord filing for an eviction for non-payment of a lease violation versus a no cause is that while a tenant can argue against or remedy an eviction for the former complaints, in a no cause case, there is no legal recourse for that tenant. In 2021, Vermont no cause eviction in Vermont, no cause evictions made up 50% of all eviction cases being filed for no for being filed in the state. Uh, but the problem is far worse than that. As an eviction on your record often means not being able to rent again, as a tenant is required to provide that information when filing a new rental application, most tenants vacate the property when asked without the issue ever going to court, meaning thousands of Vermonters are being evicted each year with no place to go and often for no reason. And I can tell you this much, uh, I work with a lot of tenants. I have been a tenant and still am a tenant myself. This has happened to nearly every single tenant that I know. I myself got evicted because we complained that there was a hole in the roof of our kitchen and we had dust falling into our food. This has led to population centers like Montpelier being drained of lower income residents and an explosion in our homeless population. According to December report of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, homelessness rates, sorry, let me just, homelessness rates rose 218% between 2007 and 2023, the largest ra rise in the United States by some distance. This has created a generational strain on public housing and services and the gutting of historical communities across Vermont. This is an issue that is affecting all of Vermont, but particularly in areas of high percentage of renters like Montpelier. The question on this town meeting day ballot uh, will ask Montpelier votes wh voters whether they wish to adopt regulatory policy for businesses that lease property to use as domiciles. This policy would ensure tenants are protected from arbitrary eviction and are free to lease property unless codifies violations occur. This policy is needed due to the current market conditions of the rental industry and the exacerbating crisis, by its, uh, exacerbating crisis created by its current trajectory. The proposed regulation will prevent widespread homelessness, worker shortages, and foster community growth in Vermont's population centers. A just cause eviction policy that protects renters from arbitrary... So a just cause eviction policy is a policy that protects renters from arbitrary, retaliatory, and discriminatory evictions by establishing only certain reasons that a landlord can evict, known as just causes. These causes include non-payment of rent, uh, a tenant's failure to accept reasonable uh, renewal terms, um, a violation of the terms of a lease, and the violation of state statutes regulating tenant obligations. Just Cause provides the right of first refusal for tenants to renew their leases once they expire, and it has been successfully implemented in four states, California, New Jersey, New Hampshire, and Oregon, and in dozens of cities across the US. Under Just Cause, Lease agreements will still remain the lawful contract between a tenant and a landlord and will still have starts and end dates like any other standard lease. However, right of first refusal is granted to tenants to renew a lease after its expiration. Landlords will, provide, will profit regardless of whether a tenant decides to renew due to the market demand and would be able to benefit from a steady stream of income due to residents who continue to rent with the assurance of not being displaced unexpectedly. Under just cause regulation, landlords also have the right to change their lease year on year. If there are actions a tenant consistently performs that the landlord does not agree with, they are well within their rights to ban those actions in future leases, so long as the rules are non-discriminatory. I want to get really into the charter language now, uh, just because it is kind of complicated. Um, so when you're first reading this on the ballot, it might look a lot like gobbledygook, but I'm going to kind of break it down just for everyone so we're all very clear about what will be on the ballot. So it starts off with shall the charter of the city of Montpelier, Montpelier as amended be further amended to give the city council the power to provide by ordinance protections for residential tenants from evictions without just cause by adopting and adding a new section to read. So this is effectively asking you, the voter, um, if you agree or disagree that the city council should be given the authority to create a just cause eviction ordinance in Montpelier. So then it goes on, it says, to provide by ordinance protections for residential tenants, as defined in Chapter 137, Title 9 of the Vermont Statutes, annotated from eviction without just cause, where just cause shall include, but is not limited to, tenants' material breach of written rental agreement, a tenant's violation of state statutes, regulating tenant obligations and residential rental agreements, non-payment of rent, and a tenant's failure to accept written, reasonable, good-faith renewal terms. I'm going to take this one by one. 
So a tenant's material breach of written rental agreement, i.e. if the lease said that there was no smoking allowed on the property and the tenant ignored that rule, that would be a violation of the written rental agreement and grounds for eviction. The landlord will get to decide what rules are in the lease at the beginning of each new lease cycle, and it would be within their rights to change the rules if they saw fit at that time. Number two, tenant's violation of state statutes regulating tenant obligations. So if the tenant was to violate a rule that is defined in Vermont state statutes that regulate rental agreements, such as being abusive to housemates or defacing the property, that would again be grounds for eviction. Non-payment of rent. So if a tenant does not pay their rent within 14 days, again, that's grounds for eviction. And a tenant's failure to accept written reasonable good faith renewal terms. So at the end of each lease cycle, if the current tenants have stuck to the rules, paid their rent on time and have been a good tenant, they will get the right of first refusal on a new lease. However, this lease does not have to be identical to the lease agreed on in the previous cycle. The landlord is free to change that lease as they see fit. If the tenant does not wish to sign this amended lease, they have forfeited this right of first refusal and the landlord is free to offer this lease to any other interested parties. In short, failure to accept a new lease would be grounds for eviction if the tenant refused to leave. Such ordinance shall exclude from just cause the expiration of a rental agreement as sole grounds for termination of tenancy. In addition to exemptions in Chapter 137 of Title IX, the ordinance shall exempt from this provision subject to mitigation pr provisions, sublets, and in-unit rentals, as well as the following properties. So here it again says that the, termination, the end of a tenancy uh, does not grant grounds for eviction, and then it also goes on to say what sorts of properties would be exempt from just cause eviction laws. So those things are owner-occupied duplexes and triplexes, those being withdrawn from the rental market, um, including properties to be occupied by the owner's immediate family member as a primary residence, accessory dwelling units on the same property as a single family owner-occupied home, and those in need of substantial renovations which preclude occupancy. To be clear here, these are a list of things that a tenant, even if they stick by the rules, do everything, pay the rent on time, look after the property, these are reasons why a tenant could still be evicted, but basically a no-fault eviction. So uh, the first one, uh, owner-occupied duplexes and triplexes, this says if the landlord was to remove a tenant without a cause, um, i.e. a family member needs to move in or there needs to be substantial renovations made, then the tenants should get, oh, sorry, I'm reading the wrong part. Uh, Owner-occupied duplexes and triplexes. So if you own a property and rent out a room or it's or a duplex or triplex and you rent the other units, you would be exempt from a just cause eviction ordinance. Landlords who live on the property they rent get a dispensation. This clause allows landlords to evict who they please, whenever they wish, and for whatever reason, if they live on the property, up to a triplex. Those being withdrawn from the rental market, so this clause allows landlords to remove the house from the property market whenever they wish to do so. If they no longer want to rent the property privately, they are under no obligation to do so and therefore can evict their tenants without cause if they take that action. Accessory dwelling units, so that works in the same way as owner-occupied duplexes and triplexes, and those in need of substantial renovations, which preclude occupancy. So for similar reasons to withdrawing a property from the rental market, if the home needs renovations and the re renovations needed are extensive enough that it requires tenants to leave, landlords can evict those tenants without a cause. The next section says, such an ordinance shall include provisions that mitigate potential negative impacts on tenants and property owners, including but not limited to requirements of adequate notice and reasonable relocation expenses to provide a reasonable probationary period after initial occupancy and limit unreasonable rent increases to prevent de facto evictions or non-renewals, although this shall not be construed to limit rents beyond the purpose of preventing individual evictions. So the first part, uh, this says that if the landlord were to remove a tenant without a cause, so a family member needs to move in, then the tenants should get adequate notice of that eviction and some moving expenses paid. How long this notice should be and how much the moving expenses would be would be up to you, the city council, to decide when writing the ordinance. To provide a reasonable probationary period after its initial occupancy, this clause allows the landlords to put a probationary period on any new tenant that occupies the house in which they would still be allowed to evict without cause. This is to allow the landlord some time to assess whether this tenant is likely going to be an issue, and if so, can evict them without cause before that probationary period is over, after which just cause protections would kick in. 
how long this probationary period would be would be up to, again, the city council to decide. A limit on reasonable rent increases to prevent de facto evictions or non-renewals. Um, this rule would prevent landlords from raising the rent to a point where it would be effectively be an eviction. For example, if your rent is $1,000 a month and your landlord was to raise it 100% to $2,000 a month, that would be seen as an, that could be seen as an unreasonable rent increase designed to evict without going through the proper channels. It effectively closed the eviction loophole, but, uh, but by design, it is not meant to stop landlords from raising the rent. What percent that is, what is unreasonable, again, would be for the city council to decide. And then finally, uh, this ordinance shall define what is reasonable and adequate notice in defining just cause and shall require the landlords to provide notice of just cause and other legal requirements as part of the rental agreement. So this last section of the chart uh, of the charter question outlines that terms such as reasonable and adequate notice shall be decided by you, the city council, when writing the ordinance. It also states that this charter change were to pass and an ordinance was to be created, landlords would have to inform the tenants of their rights when they sign their lease agreement. To be clear, this charter change, if it passes, is not a silver bullet to fix a housing crisis. To do that, we need to build more houses, dissuade second and third homeowners from leaving their properties empty, regulate the short-term rental market like Airbnbs, and create a statewide rental registry so we can understand the true extent of what's happening in Vermont. Grants for first-time home buyers and rental assistance for those trying getting, getting off the street are also important and much-needed policies. What this will do, though, is protect good tenants from bad landlords. Landlords who neglect their properties and punish tenants for making reasonable complaints. Landlords who are competing against and undercutting good landlords that look after their homes and their tenants. Those good landlords spend money to make sure their homes are secure, safe, warm, and dry. The bad landlords do not. Safe in the knowledge that if a tenant complains, they can be easily replaced. This policy will also protect good landlords from bad tenants. Tenants that don't pay their rent, tenants that destroy property, tenants that threaten their neighbours and their community members. Those tenants will be no safer from eviction than they currently are. In fact, by removing no cause as an option for landlords looking to rid themselves of tenants, we will free up the housing courts, allowing for just and reasonable eviction cases to move quicker through the courts and allowing landlords to rid themselves of problematic tenants faster. We do need to create safe and secure housing for everyone in Vermont. And while this may not get us to our goal, it does take us a step closer. If you share this vision of a safe to fair Vermont Pillia, I do urge all of you on the City Council and those listening today to vote yes on question four this town meeting day and become the fourth municipality in Vermont to be a just cause of itch in town. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, members of the council, have it. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just mentioned this is as for your information the uh what's on the warning is the charter change is too long <laughs> for the ballot so it's going to be posted prominently at the polling place and including in every single voting booth um, to make sure everybody gets to see it but just the language that you'd be voting on um rather than wordsmith it myself i just took the top of their signature sheet um, but it can be wordsmithed by you all if you find that as amended be further amended to be awkward or anything. Um, but um, just seemed to make sense to go with what people were signing. Thanks. Any members of the council have any questions? Carrie. Hi. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Um, early on you said something about an explosion in no cause evictions and said that in i believe this is right that in 2021 50 percent of all evictions in vermont were no cause evictions um so looking for a little bit of clarification a couple questions one is does that mean that 50 percent of the of the evictions were because a lease ended and the landlord opted not to renew it um or some other reason, and then also the ex how does that rate of fifty percent compare to previous years in Vermont? 
Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Kerry. Uh, no, that would be um, evictions going through the courts. So that would that wouldn't be folks that uh, where a lease ended and the landlord says we're not going to renew your lease. This is people who uh, were evicted during their lease agreement was was on. So say your lease is between January and January, they were evicted in say August, um, and the landlord used no cause as the reason for eviction. Um, there is no numbers. You can't find numbers on those people whose lease have ended and they have moved on. It's just not data that's gathered. Um, so that was your first question. And oh yeah, second question of how that was differs from previous years. Previously, pre-COVID, it was about 10%. It rose to about 50%. And according to Vermont Legal Aid, um, of the mayor, I believe, is uh, a... Uh, uh, employee of, um, uh, that has now gone down again. Uh, I think it's 20%, but I'd have to get back to you. Thank you. Any other members of the council have any questions? Okay, I'd like to open it, for, open the floor to any, uh, oh, Terry, I'm, sorry. Sorry. Um, uh, you said this is this exists in other communities and um, in other states and other parts of the country. And I'm wondering if you can tell us about what what are some of the impacts that have been seen as a result of this change. Yeah. Sorry. Um, sorry for cutting you off there, Carrie. I was there any more to that question. No. Um, so many states have actually had it for a long time. Uh, New Hampshire has had it, I believe, since the 1970s. Uh, New Jersey have had it since the 1980s. California is a bit more of a recent one. Uh, and just to clarify, in California, every town has the right to put in just cause eviction ordinances in their municipalities. It's not statewide and such. It, it covers the entire state. It's just every municipality has the right, the authority to enact a just cause eviction laws or good cause as it's otherwise known as um from what we can tell it's had no major effect on rental markets in terms of like a major drop in landlords or a major drop in rental accommodation um from what i can tell from talking to other tenants in those states what it's done is provide that greater protection for tenants there um who kind of know what the rules are and know if they can stick to them they can stay in their house um, in terms of like economic differences or, or the availability of houses, uh, there has not been any studies to show that it's dropped at all since those uh, laws came into place. Okay, yeah. Um, sometime, one time years ago, when I was uh, doing some lobbying in the state house for. Uh, or on some eviction legislation the the question that was presented to me well the, the governor wants to know why it's so much faster to evict someone in new hampshire than it is in vermont and the answer was well it is faster but only if you can do the eviction and because surprisingly new hampshire doesn't have no cause eviction there are some Landlord, some evictions that just never happen because the landlord doesn't have the ability to do that, and uh, that's that's what we're what this is getting at here. Um, oh, New Hampshire doesn't have no cause eviction. Landlord has to assert a reason uh, analogous to the reasons we uh, that are enumerated in this in order to even bring an eviction. Lauren. A couple of process questions. So if this uh, passes by the voters, it's authorizing us to, if we choose to develop an ordinance that then would go to the legislature for approval, or is this? So okay. if this passes, then this charter change would go to the legislature. And as, if they approve it and amend our charter, that would give the, as I'm that would give the council the authority to put in an ordinance as long as it was consistent with the terms of the this charter change. And then the council could choose whether to do it and what, like, sounds like there's a few 
things that the council could decide. So there's any charger change first goes to the voters, then goes to the legislature. And that. Um, okay. I'm going to open the floor to other members of the public, uh, since this is a public hearing, if, if anyone else in the public wants to be heard and I, why don't you come on up to the microphone? Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Joseph Moore. I live in Montpelier. Um, wanted you uh, to hear from a Montpelier resident, lest you thought that this was uh, like an AstroTurf campaign from meddlesome Brits. Uh, <laughs> I can assure you it is not. Uh, most of the people who have worked on collecting the signatures and who continue to work on this campaign are, in fact, residents of Montpelier. Um, and so I just want to take a couple minutes to tell you why I support this policy. Uh, so my partner and I currently own our home on Derby Drive in Montpelier, but for most of my adult life, up until a couple of years ago, I was a renter. During my 15 years or so as a tenant in multiple states, I've had some good landlords, I've had some not so good landlords, and I've had some in between. I have experienced unreasonable rent hikes uh, as high as 20% in one year, heating and plumbing issues that went unaddressed for too long. And in one particular case, a, a brown recluse spider infestation where my landlord refused to hire a professional exterminator. Um, and so while I've never actually been evicted, my experiences as a renter make me sensitive to the fact that the landlord tenant relationship is one of unequal power. Your landlord effectively has the legal authority to revoke your access to shelter. And this power differential is compounded by the fact that, as Tom outlined, Vermont has uh, among the lowest rental vacancy rates in the United States currently. So Vermonters who lose access to housing have very few alternatives. Just Cause Eviction attempts to address this power imbalance between landlords and tenants by protecting tenants from arbitrary, retaliatory, and discriminatory evictions rather than the existing status quo wherein landlords can evict tenants for no cause meaning they don't need to specify a reason, as Tom explained. The proposed Just Cause Charter language establishes explicit criteria for eviction and provides tenants with the right of first refusal to renew a lease when it expires. Just Cause Eviction protects, as Tom said, good tenants from bad landlords and good landlords from bad tenants. The proposed language would allow a landlord to evict a tenant for non-payment of rent, breach of the terms of a lease agreement, violation of state statutes regulating tenant obligations. And further, the proposed charter change would allow landlords to alter the terms of a lease agreement after expiration, so long as those changes are not considered unreasonable. And I just want to emphasize that you know, what, what is deemed unreasonable is going to be left to city council should this charter change go through. So it's going to be in your hands to decide. Um, housing discrimination on the basis of race religion, disability, et cetera, is real. We know that, right? None of us, I think, are naive enough to believe that it doesn't happen here in Montpelier. Federal and state laws exist to protect tenants from discrimination. However, no cause eviction makes enforcement of those anti-discrimination laws difficult because it means that the burden is on the tenant to prove discrimination rather than on the landlord to prove that an eviction was not discriminatory. Just cause eviction places that burden of proof on the landlord where I believe it belongs. It also protects tenants who report discrimination, code violations, or other abuses from retaliation. So in closing, I support the adoption of just cause eviction ordinance in Montpelier because I believe that no one should have the power to deny another human being access to shelter without justification. It's that simple. Just cause eviction takes an important step in correcting this imbalance. And I think as Tom did a good job explaining, it's not a panacea. We know it's not going to solve all our housing problems. It's part of a spectrum of policy initiatives that we need to get behind. So I'm glad that Montpelier residents will have the opportunity to vote on this question on March 5th. And I encourage my neighbors to vote yes. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else in the room wants to be heard? Yes. Come on in the back. Hello, I'm Hi. Mary Messier from uh, Montpelier. Uh, I have never been evicted, but I would like to see this change take place. 
Um, I had a situation in Barry a number of years ago. Um, it wasn't an eviction, but uh, I just want to tell what the story is to illuminate some of the problems that people might face. Um, and I have, you know, good credit. Uh, uh, it was there weren't any problems at this place. Um, so I lived in a fairly nice place, but I decided I didn't want to stay in Barrie. But one thing that was happening was several times the landlord, and there was only two apartments in this building, and the front part was an elderly couple, and I was in the back, and we had a very private backyard. I had a window that was a picture window, like four by five feet, looking out onto a really nice backyard. And several times I would come out of another room and see my landlord in front of this window, which for a woman living alone is very uncomfortable. But like one time he was fixing this um, air vent up top. And I know he kept his properties very good. And of course it's reasonable and we want the place to be good. But I'd been looking around for an apartment for quite a while because I didn't really want to stay in Barrie at that time, at that place, in that area. And then I decided if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna sign this lease, which he had already sent me signed um, to renew, I thought if I'm gonna do this another year, I'm gonna ask him if when he's working close to my building, could he let me know? You know, so he's got an option, knock on the door, call me, email me, text me. So I sent a note, a nice email just saying, by the way, I didn't find a place yet. I'm looking at one more place. And if it doesn't go through, then I'm going to stay another year. But by the way, um, could you let me know when you work around the building? The next day, he said, they said, we're not renewing. The very next day. So... With that in mind, and the thing that really triggered this was one day I came out of a room and I found them like the windows here, like six inches from the window. And they had their grandson with them and he looked in the window. So this is all very uncomfortable because like decades ago, I had a stalker like 30, 40 years ago. So next day... I faced that and I decided just to leave because otherwise if I fight this, it's called an eviction. And then what's my record look like? And so I became homeless. This was not necessary. We could have had a mediation. We could have talked, but instead of that, I lost my housing and you can tell it still upsets me. Yeah. So I am for this change. We need to be fair to landlords and tenants. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Is there anyone else in the room who'd like to be heard? Come on up. Yeah. Hey, I'm Thomas Graham. I'm a Montpelier resident and voter, and um, I have been collecting signatures for this charter change, and I want to encourage you all to support it. Um, I've had my own uh, terrible experiences with landlords, including when I was four years old. Um, and, you know, we may not all in this room agree about the ethics of the housing market and the way things are run right now. But I think one thing we can agree on, I think everybody's on the same page about the right of um, queer and trans and, and gay people to have the same kind of housing access that anyone else does. And Vermont and the federal government has some laws that are uh, supposed to take care of that, but they only really do so de jure. And the only way we can make sure that those laws are enforced de facto is with just cause eviction, because we have evangelical dark money flowing into Vermont, trying to flip it from a blue state because they know it's a small and vulnerable state. And uh, I know a lot of other folks in the queer community, including and, and myself, are, are afraid for our access to housing because... Um, our, our protections are just unenforceable until we have just cause. So please support this. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the room who would like to be heard, Steve? And while uh, 
while he's coming up, I'd ask anyone on Zoom who wants to be heard to uh, activate your hands up feature and we'll get to you next. Uh, Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. Um, I want to ask the voters to support the charter change because and, and make clear the point that, that this is a multi-step process. It's the rubber will meet the road if and when an ordinance gets approved by the voters and refined and all the detail gets put in. This is basically just creating an opportunity for the council to move forward towards uh renter protection. And it, it this is not at this stage, it is not a threat to anybody. Not even not even landlords. That this is basically just laying a foundation that will give us more options for how we address the Airbnb crisis, the homelessness crisis. The uh, we we know we've got some uh, let's say lax landlords in town, and uh, we need to develop strategies to remedy that. I did a records request about part of a building falling into the river and potentially injuring people. And the records request revealed that our building inspector wrote to the city manager says, we can't enforce that because if we do, we'll have to start enforcing it evenly on everybody. Yeah, you should. That's We've got a real deficit in our building inspection and enforcement. And uh, this is just one example of, I encourage you to help get the word out that this is not a Binding thing that happens automatically. This is going to be a multi, uh, probably a two-year process, and that kind of protections is a uh, human rights issue. Thanks, Steve. Um, Carolyn Ridpath. There we go. You should be able to speak now. Um, I'm going to come at this from a little different per, uh, perspective which is the same one that Mary Messier pointed out, is that we have a growing number of homeless people. And I think this is a step in the right direction of kind of uh, stabilizing that so we don't have the uh, rampant increase we've been seeing. So I'm in favor of passing it. Thank you. Is there anybody else online who'd like to be heard? I'm not seeing any hands coming up. Anyone in the room who hasn't been recognized yet who'd like to be heard? Okay, then I will close our public hearing. Do we have any comments from members of the council? Donna. Mine come before at the end of the, of the close of the hearing, but I, I really appreciate all the work you've done and to get the signatures. And I appreciate what Stephen put it in context. It is part of the process and it will get a lot of discussion which is really good. And I and I like the idea that it gives the council the option, should it pass, and then they can work on the details. And I do think the balance is important. So thank you. I just want to speak to that. I think when we were writing this, and it was written quite a few years ago um, with the help of some, some fantastic experts on housing. Uh, the head of One Affordable Housing Coalition was a big part of that. Sarah Carpenter, who used to head up Housing in Vermont, was, was part of the writing as well. And we realized that each municipality is going to be different. Each of them is going to have its own way of doing things when it comes to the rental market in town, because, you know, every town in Vermont is unique. And so these were baked in specifically to give city council members like yourself the leeway because you have the knowledge of your towns in order to make this ordinance as best as it possibly could be and be as balanced as it possibly could be for all your residents, not just tenants, not just landlords, but for everyone. Thanks, Tom. Any other council members have any comments? Uh, Lauren? Yeah, just also grateful to all the folks in the community who have been gathering signatures and working on this and for the comments this evening. Um, I'm also interested in seeing this move forward, giving us the opportunity to dig into it, figure out the issues. I mean, knowing we're not the first, there's a lot of other experiences to learn from, but you know, everything we've been hearing from our city housing committee, our homelessness task force, it's, you know, there's so many different approaches I think we need to be looking at so that we're not exacerbating homelessness, that we're keeping people housed. And so just, I think it's a good conversation to have. So thanks to everyone working on it. Anybody else? Okay, 
we can move on. Thanks for coming in, Tom. And I'll mention to the members of the public that uh, we will take this up again at our next meeting, which is uh, February 1st, a week from uh, tomorrow. Next up, the uh, second public hearing on our budget. And I will open the public hearing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So you get to watch my weekly struggle with um, screen sharing. Uh, actually, have the since you made no changes last week, it's the identical presentation as last week, but I will still run it through here. Um, oh, I need to open it first, right? That's what I understand. Yes, there we go. You're not an expert after last week? You'd think. I'm a slow learner. Do I get back to see? Well, for some reason my Zoom's not reopening. Oh, here we go. It says, there we go. We'll have time for a break. Promise. An hour. I'm not going to talk for an hour. Okay, here we go. I think we got it. All right, so this is a rerun from last week, but for those that are tuning in for the first time or uh, watching for the first time, we'll do a summary of the city council's budget. Uh, this is our last, our second and final public hearing. The council does need to adopt a budget tonight and vote to put uh, a, a sum of money on the ballot. Uh, like any budget, we start with uh, basic goals and our goals are uh, pretty constant, uh, but the, this year in particular it was to implement our strategic plan, uh, policies and goals, to continue our investment in infrastructure, to deliver responsible services, and to stay within the range of inflation rate, which was 3.2% when we presented the budget. It went up to 3.4% in December. So our key factors, uh, and I think this is really important, is that we had, uh, as you've heard, uh, some areas have been under budgeted in prior years as we attempt to balance a lot of things. So we updated our budget amounts this year to make sure we had uh, accurate totals. Um, we've seen increased costs and delays due to uh, floods, COVID, all sorts of things. Uh, and uh, we have a backlog of infrastructure projects we're trying to get to. In addition, we are in our current budget, we're struggling with a pretty significant uh, loss of revenue and, and the council's adopted a one and a half million dollar rescission, rescission to our current budget. And we are still working hard to manage that. Uh, and I can talk a little bit about that more either during this process or under the manager's report later. And lastly, we had a reappraisal and that had two uh, two impacts on this budget. One is that it changed uh, people's tax bills. Some people's went down, but I think a lot of residents in particular went up. And, uh, and in addition, the process that we, the council and the Board of Civil Authority have just completed of reviewing uh, tax appeals actually increased uh, the 3.2% budget up to 3.93% just from uh, granting uh, reductions in tax appraisal. So we had a lot of factors working against us. The flood, of course, uh, certainly creating um, a struggle in our current year. And, and I think some of that is residual for the future year. So I'm not going to read all of this, but you can see the main areas of our strategic plan are around infrastructure, housing, resilience, um, the economy, and public health and safety. So those are the, the main topics. And we tried to make sure we had some funding in for all of them, even under a, a difficult year. I point out that um, when we first got the budget uh, and all the requests and looked at everything in order to do what we would do, uh, what if, if we were able to do our fully approved budget this year, not the, res the res uh, rescinded one, uh, and then at, completed that next year as well uh, with all of its increased costs, and funded the requests that we got, uh, we would have been up about a million and a half dollars beyond this budget. So we we had to reduce 1.4 million to get to uh, the budget we presented to you. 
So we in the build and maintain uh, infrastructure. Uh, we have eleven million dollars in FEMA projects. Those are separate. We have our own uh, share of that. Although I do know the legislature is working on uh, possibly funding some or all of the municipal shares of FEMA projects. We'll see where that goes. Um, for the first time in a couple of years, our our capital plan is fully funded in uh, at two point four million. Although that number could be a lot higher. And apropos to the uh, comments that were. Um, made earlier, accurate comments by our DPW staff, um, our, our equipment plan is fully funded within that capital plan. So there's 593,000, it actually exceeds our target of 515,000 and includes three DPW trucks. So there is an attempt to start to catch up on some of those uh, delayed investments. Uh, includes 658,000 in paving. Our goal of course is to get to a million, but it's an increase from 200 and something thousand last year. We have $2 million for water line improvement, uh, which is uh, working towards our uh, our plan to uh, upgrade our water lines. And we have plans for several major projects in the works. They're not all funded in this budget. Uh, we did reduce, as you heard, one position in DPW. We're hoping we can reposition one, uh, but we'll see. Uh, and we are working with DBW now. Well, I'll save that for later, but we think we're we're trying to work on their shifts to save some money in this year and possibly for next year uh, and also provide them, allow them to be more uh, efficient. Um, create more housing. We uh, had 110,000 in the housing trust fund in this current budget. It was uh, slated to be for uh, elections and the prior year's budget was used for uh, country club road we had 110,000 in the present budget that was actually part of the budget rescission we've cut that to zero in our current fiscal year we um, put 50,000 in from the housing trust fund we'd note that they actually started with a request for 250,000 we kept the planning and development staff which is small anyway to handle all of our permits they're handling all of the FEMA repairs and funding on all of that, as well as moving the Country Club Road housing project forward. It's the the biggest chance I think we have to obtain housing. Uh, we have the lease revenue from that available. I know there's some discussion about how that should be best used, and I think that's a great converse, conversation, uh, but some of it at least ought to be used to for some of the consulting costs for moving this project forward. Uh, at your next meeting, you'll start the first public hearing on zoning amendments. Uh, if we're not here till midnight on the budget, you'll hear an update from Mike tonight, uh, getting you prepped for that. And however, there was 40,000 in direct funding for the Country Club Road project, which was eliminated. For a good uh, practicing good environmental stewardship, we maintain our sustainability and facilities coordinator. Uh, we reduced a request from uh, Mopular Energy uh, advisory committee from 12,000 to 2,000, uh, but we are still actively searching for the 10,000, which would be for some consulting help to look at the district heat, pro heat process. We have a very substantial uh, water resource recovery facility, uh, wastewater sewer plant, however you want to call it, uh, project moving forward. The voters have approved $19 million on that and that is uh, moving forward steadily. We have CSO projects to prevent uh, out, sewer outflows into the river, those are all active. Uh, on the other side, we have, uh, we propose cutting GMT my ride by 40,000, propose cutting the Conservation Commission by 3,500, tree board by 4,000. And I think the hardest cut from city staff perspective was the AmeriCorps program uh, for the parks for 25,000, which represents two full-time people for a year and the Mopular Youth Conservation Corps funding for 40,000, which is the, the group of young folks that work in the parks and certainly were instrumental in the floods this summer. Um, for advancing the economy and dealing with economic issues, uh, we reduced the homelessness task force funding from 45,000 to 17,500 and the balance, the difference in that fund funding, the 27,500 was used to fund the social embedded social worker within the police department. Uh, the community fund, which goes to nonprofit agencies through a request process, we kept at 134, 150, which is the amount they had in the last couple of years. They had a requested 166, 875 based on the activity they've seen. Montpelier Alive, of course, a very important partner. We kept them in at their full funding of 326. They also get downtown improvement district funds, but we did cut $100,000 for economic development. 
ten thousand for arts and ten thousand for social equity and justice. Some of those had also been cut in this current year as part of our budget rescission. Improve public health and safety. We are maintaining the crisis intervention uh, team training program uh, to get both our police and firefighters uh, better able to respond to people in crisis, uh, a mental health crisis uh, situation. We've maintained or kept the social worker position. We are proceeding with shelter planning as well as the shelter, the temporary shelter at the Elks Club and planning for pot, um, permanent future shelter. And we've kept the senior center, which is an important uh, lifeline for elder people. We delayed a staff increase for the police. We did not cut a position, but they were due to be increased uh, back up to 17, and we've delayed that. We uh, cut the canine program, uh, which was $20,000. We've had a reduction in recreation staffing and funding, one full-time position in operations cuts, and the child care program was eliminated. Um, for responsible and engaged government, again, we initially proposed a 3.2% increase, kept keeping it within inflation. That moved to 3.93% after tax appeals, and um, it's currently at 4.7%. The expenditures within the budget, it's important to note, are only up essentially 3.2%. So the city is not spending wildly. We're spending within inflation. The communications coordinator is uh, retained uh, and the Zen City platform, uh, which has been used for surveying and to provide really good information for people is out. We do have future admin staff uh, reductions um, to be determined for 65,000. We've eliminated the bridge page for 14,000, although they've told us they could do it for 9,500. The um, American National Citizen Survey, which was done in 2022, would have been scheduled to have been done again in 24. Um, that has been eliminated. We eliminated the committee stipends for 20,000 and outside lobbyists for 15,000. Um, I did not also put on that, but uh, just so people are aware, the entire uh, department head leadership team also volunteered uh, not to take any um, cost of living adjustment for next year, which saves another $50,000. Um, so changes since the initial proposal, there's really only been two changes. One, I already mentioned the grand list changes due to tax appeals, increased uh, the tax rate, just that in itself. And then the council has voted to restore a firefighter position in the budget, uh, which added $88,000. So uh, increasing the tax rate increased from 3.93% to 4.7%. Those are the only changes since the initial proposal so far. They have still have tonight. Uh, just taking a quick look graphically, uh, this is where our money comes from. Uh, again, about two-thirds of it is from property tax and then uh, various other. other. Uh, and actually, when you count 3% of ballot items as well, uh, non-city budget, uh, it's really about 70%. Um, where does it go? Uh, you can, this is divided by department, so you can see really, you know, police and dispatch at 21, fire at 15, public works at 18, uh, those are our big, and then if you add the uh, capital plan, another 11, those are the big services in the big areas, and that makes sense, those are our biggest services. If we take a look at general, cut it a little bit differently, um, you can see we're about 55% personnel, uh, and that's one of the reasons that drives costs is, is uh, pay changes and benefit cost change and, and those kind of things competing in a very difficult market. We've had we've had a lot of vacancies the last couple of years, which we've been able to stop, but some of that required pay adjustments. Uh, and then our other areas, oops, that is not what I wanted to do. There we go. Just if you take a look at those employees and break them down by function, you can see uh, there are people really working at discrete functions uh, they're not just all lumped together doing one or two things. There are people, uh, we can, all these will be in the annual report if you wish to study them more in more detail. Taking a look at our debt and annual debt and equipment funding, um, you can see that uh, the total, the fourth column over is the total. Uh, and we, this year we're at 2.4 million. As you can see, it has been since FY21 that we were at that full amount uh, and um, dropped you know, through COVID and the other areas in the last couple of years uh, and then showing where that goes. It shows 415 in equipment. There's an additional um, bunch of uh, money in debt for equipment. So that together that brings it up to the 593 we combined. So that debt total has equipment money in it. 
Um, so that is the total fund. So it's up 11%, 246,000 in this chart that just shows us increasing at 4% a year, approximately 100,000. Um, that's a policy conversation, of course, for next year. Um, but uh, we think that could probably be even greater. Uh, and it's also one of the reasons why we had stress on this year's budget. I think as a not the council and the city staff said we need to get this at 2.4 million. So that added a $246,000 increase in the budget um, that we considered untouchable. And so we had to cut everything else around that in order to meet this priority. And this is just graphically looking at our debt scheduled debt payments and the annual project and equipment funding. Uh, you can just see how, if you have a total sum of money, if that's slowly growing and debt's dropping off, then your annual money to do the things that you need to do can rise uh, even greater than the 4%. So this brings us all to the tax rate calculation. Uh, and this is uh, small, I get it, um, but basically it's showing the 4.7% uh, tax increase for residents. Uh, there, Obviously you have got the city budget, the county tax, and the ballot items make up uh, all of this together. Uh, and uh, an average home in Montpelier after the reappraisal uh, is valued at $370,000. Uh, so that home for the municipal portion would see about $160 increase in property taxes for a local share. So taking a look at um, what you're paying for in that tax bill, this takes our various services, deducts revenues that are attributable to those services. Uh, so, you know, the building inspector, you can see is only $2.60 because they are almost completely funded by fees. The fire uh, is smaller than uh, the, in the other graph because they have the ambulance fees. Um, so we try to assign those uh, directly and you can see kind of what the net cost is for each service that people are getting. So for, you know, $700, you get your police and dispatch, for example, and um, $536, you get your public works department. Uh, taking a look at our overall residential tax distribution bill, um, and we do have the city's, the school's budget now that was approved last week. It's on the ballot for tonight. So this, this is how the tax bill would work next year, uh, this coming year, assuming someone does not have income sensitivity and was paying the full freight. So about 56% for the school, 38% for the city, uh, the sewer and CSO charges, and then the county taxes, et cetera, and the ballot items. So if you look at everything together, I just need to move something on my screen so I can see better. Um, you've got the city budget, the sewer and CSO benefit charges, which have not changed from last year. Um, the school is proposing a 19% tax increase, um, and the county tax is up just a wee bit. No, actually, it's not. Um, yeah, $22. I don't think that's going to make that much difference. Uh, and then the ballot items are a little bit extra. And then our water, we have not set water and sewer or stormwater rates yet. The stormwater is still a new, um, potentially new project. Uh, the city council has set a policy of inflation plus 1% for both water and sewer with 1% going toward uh, inf infrastructure investment. Uh, and that has been working pretty successfully. So if they follow, if we followed that policy this year, this is based on what that would look like at 4.1%. The stormwater fee is still under discussion that we may or may not have a stormwater utility starting in July. It would have its own fee. One thing I neglected to mention last week is some of that fee is likely to be coming from the sewer and CSO benefit charges. So those numbers could drop, probably not all of it, but there might be some double counting in here. But um, taking the sort of worst case scenario, this is an all in estimate if you are an average residential value and an average residential usage of uh, water use. So all in 12.5%, it's uh, not great. So um, here's where we've been and where we're going. We've The budget was presented in December. We had a workshop in December and January and a couple in January. Uh, first public hearing was held last week. The second public hearing is tonight now. And the council will have to approve a budget and warning after this. And then town meeting is on Tuesday, March 5th. And uh, uh, early balloting will start at some point in February when the city clerk deems it so. 
And uh, and we have had some questions, and again, uh, about the town meeting date. Some noted that the city of Barry moved its town meeting to May. Our charter, uh, Section 501 of our charter, states that our town meeting shall be on the first Tuesday in March and does not give the council the authority to change that date. Uh, so if we were wished to move our town meeting date, it would re require a charter change on this year's ballot, of which we're already too late to do. Uh, and then the voters would have to approve it, the charter change would approve, and then it would take effect the following year. So we do not have that same flexibility. Um, so I think I've talked long enough. Happy to answer any questions and happy to listen to any comments. And I'm sure the council has its own conversation out. So that is the summary. Okay, thanks, Bill. Since this is a public hearing, I will start by saying if we have uh, any members of the public here in the room or on uh, on Zoom, starting with people here in the room, because it's uh, easier for me to see those people, um, who would like to be heard on this budget? Uh, Jake. And you're bringing uh, Patrick up with you. Okay. You've seen a lot of us recently. <laughs> Um, I'm Jake Brown. I'm chair of the Cemetery Commission, the Greenmount Cemetery Commission, and Patrick Healy is the director of the Cemetery Commission of the Cemetery. Um, we uh, have asked for you to restore some money into our budget, um, and uh, we've been here twice asking that. Uh, we had a long conversation about it at our commission meeting today, and um, we developed a, a statement we'd like to to enter into the record on this sure. issue, and so we'll do that, and then maybe we can get. Get John a copy or proceed. Uh, so this is a statement from the Greenmount Cemetery Commission to the Montpelier City Council, January 24th, 2024. On behalf of the entire Cemetery Commission, we want to thank the Council for the time, patience, and consideration that you've put into what is perhaps one of the most difficult budget, budget processes in recent memory. We recognize that no decision you are making is an easy one. We also think it's important that the City Council understands that there's a long-standing legal relationship between the City and the cemetery, and our participation in the budget process is part of that legal relationship, and from our perspective, that process needs improvement. Therefore, we'd like you the opportunity to educate and inform the Council about the legal relationship between the City and the cemetery so that there will be a greater understanding between the two parties going forward. And we'd like to schedule a time to be on the City Council agenda as soon as as is practical for that purpose. Um, so that's the that's the statement from the commission, and we would like to schedule some time to have some have a conversation about the relationship and and budgeting. Sure, uh, sometime probably be relatively after the soon. Probably be after town meeting day, but we'll see. Okay, so uh, what is the process for getting on the agenda? Is that something that <clears throat> we ask you to do? The request has been made. We will make it happen. Okay. I think it would just make sense to do it after election because then the group going yep. forward, if there's any changes, would understand yep. that. That's only two or three. Do you meetings. have anything to add, Patrick? Okay. Thanks for the uh, opportunity. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks for coming in. Hi, Joe Moore. Um, Thanks for the presentation, and uh, I appreciate the work that the staff and, and the council have put into the budget. I know um, difficult decisions have been made. One concern or slash question that I have is around the the DPW position that's being cut. Um, you know, in in light of what we heard from from the DPW staff earlier in the meeting, it sounds like those guys are stretched pretty thin at the moment. And uh, I'd be curious to know about the the rationale for that cut. You know, is this is this um, is this through attrition? Are we laying off city employees? Um, and what, if any, impacts we anticipate this would have on operations, given given what we heard from from our uh, city employees? So thanks. Thanks. I could respond to that if you'd like. Um, it would not be a layoff. We have actually currently two vacant positions. So this would actually be filling one of them. So they would have more people than they currently have tonight out salting roads. Uh, we certainly take their concerns very seriously. We're looking at... Um, I don't, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but there are some internal changes we can make that might allow an existing position to be more useful on the road than where it's doing so that the response is is the same. Um, but 
it's very, and we are also working with them. Um, it's going to announce later, but I've mentioned it a couple of times. So we are going to be implementing very quickly uh, an attempt to try different shifts. So we're going to have, um, and they've just agreed to it today, which is why it's sort of hot off the press. But uh, in part because of the current financial circumstances this year, we're going to now start a shift that runs starts at 11 p.m., goes to 7.30 a.m. So rather than calling people out for overtime for uh removal will have a crew of like i think it's six people all of whom volunteered none were made to do it uh who will already be on staff to do snow removal snow that kind of thing and then another crew will come in at 7 a.m and so we're hoping that will relieve some of the burden that they talked about as well as um hopefully working better i think it should we should have faster response at night when there's a storm because people don't have to be called in during the daytime when there's storms there will be less people plowing so we might see it not going as fast during the daytime, but all it, but we will be able to do more uh, snow removal, those kind of operations more um, cost effectively overnight. And I think perhaps the most important thing of all is by doing it this way and um, is we won't have people working 20, 24 hour shifts. The most anyone would work would be 16 hours and then go home uh, because if you're and that, you know, that is a fatigue factor as they mentioned, and it's a, a safety factor. So, we very much appreciate the support for DPW and we very much are sympathetic to um, their concerns and we're working really hard and we really appreciate, frankly, uh, the DPW staff's willingness to make a big change like this. They recognize the financial concerns. Uh, you know, police have also stepped up and really made some changes in their scheduling uh, to reduce overtime costs. So we really appreciate it. And most of the other departments are running short. So we've appreciated those departments that have really, um, tried to make this work. Thanks, Bill. Is there anybody else in the room who'd like to be heard? Steve. Steve Whitaker again. Um, it seems kind of tone deaf that y'all take this budget from the management staff and you tinker with it one item, two items. You know, people are saying the tax burden is too high and the staff is too high. And y'all are afraid to deal with that. You know, you, you're adding 12% to people, which is going to pass into the rents and pass into the price of coffee and everything else. So you really are going through the motions rather than the, to call these public hearings is really venting sessions because you're not effectively going to change that this and vote it out tonight, you know, and, and that's really an insult to the people's effort to come here and try to plead with you to have started earlier and to give us meaningful purchase on changing some of this, you know, like I said, the, the facilities sustainability quarter was supposed to make the district heat system pay for itself. We still got a $200,000 debt deficit in, district heat, as I understand it, and we're paying, you know, him, what, 20000 more than he was making his building inspector or more. What's that position cost? 120 so, Yeah. With benefits. Sir. Yeah. I mean, this, this is not sustainable and, it, and it's an insult to the taxpayers and including the renters and the property owners. The suggestion that we're going to keep moving on the country club road plan. We don't have a plan. And as I pointed out last time, we don't even have due diligence on whether we can get traffic off a of route two. So, and we've cut the funding that would have paid for the kind of engineering analysis. So I'm concerned that the public works, we've, we've put money in there for paving and public works and projects, but we don't have the staff to actually implement them. So it's kind of hollow, hollow, pretense at getting things done. So I'm disappointed, disgusted with your your ability to take some of the fat out of the administration. And, you know, we have, oh, we can't put bathrooms in or even a shower at, at the shelter, but we can we can pay for embedded social workers and street outreach. You know how many times the street outreach comes out and says, I got nothing for you. I got nothing for you. You know, that's going through the motions. You know, if you don't have something, don't keep spending our money on it. You know. Thank you. 
Um, I'm going to look to the uh, people on Zoom to see if there's anyone who's looking to be heard. So please either raise your hand or activate your electronic hand. Are you looking to be heard? Come on up. Uh, Ken Christman, Montpelier Fire Department. I spoke to you guys, I think, at the first hearing about how important adding this position back in was. It was a due cut that was made in the budget. I know I've heard it's about an addition, but it's not. It's just keeping us whole where we're at right now. Uh, I talked about call volumes and how important that would be and where that would affect us by taking that position out. Like last Tuesday, we ran calls all night through the winter storm. At 2 a.m., I was headed to Burlington with a critical care patient in an ambulance with a nurse and respiratory therapist and all that, you take that person away and we don't do that call. That was a person we did CPR on, got their pulse back, and then they had to go to Burlington for further care. Without that spot, we don't do that run. It has Now that person has to wait for another ambulance and all that stuff, and who knows what that outcome is. I've already talked on all that stuff. I don't want to keep pounding that on you guys. Um, I know there's big decisions to be made. We talked about in 2020 when COVID started, there was furloughing people, and we deemed that your fire and ambulance people were essential. You needed us. You you wanted us there to take the sick to the hospital and do all that stuff. We're still that essential. Like through the flood, we were essential. Every guy in that fire department came in and worked through the floods to do whatever we needed to do to help wherever we needed to help. Um, my house took on some water, not a huge amount, nowhere near like what you guys did, but I still came to work. My spouse handled the flooding at our house. We had other guys who were taking on water. They ran home to see what they could do. They came right back. Like, and we worked, there was no questions asked. There was nobody hiding from that. Like, we're just asking to keep us whole so we can continue providing that service that you expect. And it goes to that survey that we talked about. The, the three most important things that they said in that survey were, your police, your fire, and your DPW. So I'm just asking you to kind of acknowledge that survey and keep that survey to what your constituents, your your voters wanted you to have. Obviously, it's not every voter in Montpelier, but they took the time. They filled that survey out. They, they're they asking you to not touch those positions, and that's all I'm asking you guys to do. So thank you. Thanks for coming out. Claire. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Hi, thank you. Thank you for all your work that you've done on the budget and for the late nights you've spent on on this. Um, I guess I just wanted to um, vocalize just some concern over you know the increases um, and ask the council to think about how like the compounding factors that are weighing on homeowners, you know, from what we're looking at for those increases um, in the school budget and along with just personal homeowners insurance increases, car insurance increases. Um, and I guess I'm here just to ask the council just to critically look at those services, um, you know, to, to fund those services that are kind of critically essential to the most vulnerable in our community um, and think about how we could kind of prioritize the priorities to help kind of work through the budget a bit more and find some extra areas where there could be some places where, um, you know, that could be cut. And I recognize it's a hard process and 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 that it's not easy to do, but um, I just wanted to come out this evening and um, express my concerns and make that request of the council. Um, and also thank you for the work that you're doing. Thanks, Claire. Is there anybody else out there in Zoom land who's looking to be heard and is there anyone else in person in the room who who's looking to be heard okay i am not seeing any one else who's got their hand raised and i'm looking for help from the meeting hosts and i don't think they're seeing anyone either. So um, at this point, I will close the public hearing.
and go to uh, council discussion. And council, so where we are, we all know where we are from Bill's presentation. But we, uh, our uh, budget is uh, essential eighty-eight thousand has an eighty-eight thousand dollar addition. The only thing that we have uh, changed from the uh, administration's proposed uh, budget, um, we've had uh, we've had votes previously. Um, nobody is. Uh, is required to adhere to um, votes you cast at, cast at the previous meeting, but I will open it up for discussion or proposals. Ellen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I wanna uh, make a motion to use uh, $50,000 from um, Housing Trust Fund and 5000 from legal um, to uh, to use that fifty five thousand um, dollars a month to offset the fire um, fighter position. Okay, so that's a proposal to do to cut that from the budget. Yeah. Right. Okay. Is there a second? Seconded by Tim. Thanks, Sarah. Is there any discussion? And I'm looking at, oh, Sal. You're about to be unmuted. Okay. You're... Great, thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to amend that if possible, Ellen. Uh, I don't know exactly how we go about that, but I'm going to make one last stab at um, helping with this offset. There's $33,000 left. I'm suggesting we we reduce overtime across the board by about 10% to make up that difference. So, so your proposal is to amend the uh, motion? By... To equal 88000 to come from uh, overhead. Okay. Uh, over time, over time. Sorry. Okay. And, and I mean, I mean, no disrespect to the people who who use the overtime. I just, when I look at, I see a trend in overtime that looks problematic to me, and I'm surprised that others don't see it. But to see it going up so rapidly over the last couple of years, uh, obviously there there are pressures on on the city, but it seems to me that uh, something's not working, and. You know, this is a budget for six months in the future. We have time to work it out. I like what I just heard from um, Bill about uh, changing scheduling. I think there are solutions out there. This is ten, a little bit more than ten percent of the increase for this year, which is two hundred eighty-two thousand. I'm talking about thirty-three thousand dollars. Okay, thanks, thanks, Sal. Is is there a second to Sal's motion to amend the pending motion? Yeah. I second. Okay. Second. It, it's it been moved and seconded to amend Pellin's motion. So now the motion on the table is, shall we amend Pellin's motion by adding an additional 33,000 to the yes. to the reduction? Is there any discussion? Uh, Carrie? You should be able to go now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to vote against this amendment, but it, and I, I think the underlying question that of Palin's motion, I think, still needs further discussion. Um, and I also would like us to look at some other opportunities for some other things to cut. So I, I guess I'm. This process is a little clunky to me. I think I would feel happier if we did things one at a time. So that's why I'm, that's just me saying that's why I'm going to vote no on this one, because I don't want to make that cut to overtime um, because I'm not sure how that would actually play out. And I, I feel like we've been told from several people on the staff that they've done and to reduce overtime and they need it as a tool for their, their management of their staff time. 
I don't know exactly how that works, but I'm kind of believing them and I'm just nervous about just making a cut to it. I'm not sure what would happen. Um, so that's why I would vote against that one. But I do want to continue talking about ways that we can, other reductions that we can find. Okay. Thanks, Carrie. So anyone else? Uh, Donna. I agree with Carrie. I mean, we put the, the amount in there because that's what we've been having. And it actually is better than it had been, but we've cut staff back. So when emergency happens or parades or whatever, uh, somebody gets sick, we've had staff out on medical leave, and you end up with overtime. And I'd rather have it in the budget than have us go over. I would want to ask process, is it possible to talk about some of these without making them individual motions? Or is the motions the only way to do it? I, I think it's fine to to do that. We've got a motion before us now, okay. but I think it's fine to, uh, when we dispose of this, to talk about the range of options and then get to the point where someone could make a motion. I'd like to do that after these motions yeah. are done. Thank you. Uh -huh. Tim. Just listening. So I guess, Donna, part of the frustration on the overtime budget for me is it's a really big increase like 664,000 to roughly 950 range overall for the whole operation. And pretty much as we've gone through this process, the reason has been, well, it is what it is. And I'm not willing to accept that. I, I think we do need to take some action. It hasn't stayed the same. It's gone up a lot. And um, maybe it is being honest about what it is, but it does look like something that in you know, other kinds of operations that I'm familiar with, that managing differently, you could reduce it. We're not. We're choosing not to, though, and I think that's a mistake if we won't even discuss it. And clearly, we haven't. So, yeah. Uh, can I ask Bill how this uh, three thousand, sorry, thirty-three thousand, will affect uh, the services? Um. You know, we'd have to. So it would be allocated probably 10,000 or so to each department. Uh, it would have some effect. I mean, I think we'd have to look at, it would, so there's, is it, you know, there's sort of scheduled overtime and then there's emergency response overtime. And, you know, one of the things we're trying to do with the DPW move is to have, you know, more scheduled work time as opposed to response overtime. Um, you know, as I said, I think um, the, the one that's been the toughest to crack so far has been the fire department. Um, they, you know, that has we're going to be continue working on that, but it hasn't been as flexible with those employees as have been with other other employees willing to make some changes. So we've got to figure that out. Um, the, you know, the police have have adjusted their schedule. So I mean, if if this is what you want, we'll have to make it work. I think I I want to say again for those that are watching and just to, that. Uh, the number in the budget has increased drastically. It isn't that drastic over what was actually used. And so part of it is putting in the number that was actually used. So yes, it's a big budget increase, but it's not a big spending increase and combination of increase in pay, which has, um, you know, made the overtime rates higher and that was necessary to fill our positions. And, um, you know, like I said, right at the beginning, we were right-sizing the budget and putting it, trying to get the right numbers in. So it's not like we're saying, oh, all of a sudden, sure, we're going to use a whole lot more overtime. We're saying we're actually budgeting it um, more on the line. But, you know, I mean, we, everyone has to make decisions and you're here to make decisions and we will do what we have to do. Um, Helen, go ahead and then... So I know these are not easy decisions. That's why I just want to um, um, vote something that will affect at least negatively uh, our uh, like city services. That's why I was asking if this uh, 33,000 will affect really, really bad or we can do it without it. So because, you know, I, I explained this before, I think when I look at the budget, most of Things are like numbers for me, but city staff and city manager, you know what's the impact. So it is important for me to hear from you uh, what will be the impact is. Thank so, you. So, you know, just one more comment on that is, you know, part of it is you don't know, right? We don't know how many snowstorms we're going to have 
the rest of this winter or next winter. We don't know how many fires and ambulance calls we're going to have. They're up. We don't know how many police calls. We don't know how many people are going to be injured. And so we have to backfill, uh, you know, those kind of things. So, so it, it's always a crapshoot. And one of the things we've done in the past, which got us into the situation, was we'll say, all right, we got to we got to balance this budget. Let's knock thirty or fifty thousand off of overtime, and hopefully it'll work. And you know, we've tried different things, but other things happen that that are are. I think that said, you know, is this? I don't. I'm not sure that. We wouldn't recommend this, but I'd say it's less disruptive than, you know, cutting another position or something like that. I think, you know, it's in terms of maintaining our services, it's, it's, uh, we can do more with the folks we have and use them, you know, smarter and hopefully get them engaged with doing things differently as well, because, uh, you know, it takes all of us to participate. So. Lauren. Yeah, I guess just kind of in that vein like I, I appreciate this conversation and like looking for creative ways to to reduce that. And we're not increasing staffing in any of these departments. And, you know, so it's not like we're structurally changing things in a way that gives me comfort. It's going to happen. So my concern with it is we're putting this on paper, but then we're actually going to spend it. So we're really just doing a cut somewhere else down the line. Like we're going to have to make some other discussion because like, unless you see like, no, we're, yeah, we're, yeah, sure. There's some great things that we can try and, so I guess I I don't feel comforted by what I'm hearing that we're de like that we definitely can find this money to cut in overtime. It might just end up being that we cut something else later. So we're kind of postponing a hard discussion essentially by doing this, which might look good on paper and seem easier to do politically, but it's just kicking the can down the road. Donna. I one of the disadvantages, I guess, of being on the council four terms is that when I first got on, we did an in-depth thing on overtime. I think at that point it might've been much higher. <laughs> and we actually looked at the sizing and that's why the 17 everywhere in the, the police and the FAR got established and, and reaffirmed that again, that seemed to work. And I think as, as long as we're going to be responding to the needs within the FAR department and the EMS and the, the police, not only with their regular service to the community, but we also have regional things that happen that we're mutual aid and we have the state house and protests and marches. So if we're going to stay a lively capital city, we're going to have these expenses. And I would rather budget it and not spend it than once more cut it so that it looks good on paper, but ultimately we end up spending it. So that's where I'm at on the, on the cut on overtime. Do you want to mention a conversation with Janet? Do you want to mention your conversation with Janet? Okay. Tim, were you about to say something? It seems like most of the overtime is emergency related from what we've heard, but not all. Right? All the overtime is not emergency related. I mean, like water plant, water. Yeah, okay. plant. Well, there, uh, there are certain facilities that you're running and just part of your operating. Right. Model. So, so what, I, yes, you're right. And, um, and, that is, again, it's keeping an essential 24 hour, you know, daily. I mean, what, provision of safe water is probably the most important thing that we do. So we do have people that need to come in on weekends to do certain water safety testing and those kind of things. You're right. So, but, you know, that is also very predictable. That hasn't changed a lot over the years. I mean, we know what those folks are. They do get call outs as well on emergency or something. They, the, the, there's automated alarms in that building. So, they could get they get an alarm they can check online and look in uh, in their computer to see whether something they can fix remotely or whether they need to come in but those and obviously if there's something going off with the water system then we want them in doing that uh, but in terms of the schedule there's you know every everyone it happens every weekend and same thing i think at the the wastewater plant there's testing but those are part of our base budget those are and those are in the water and sewer rates not <laughs> be part of this anyway but yes so there is some scheduled overtime that is non-emergency response but but that's also true with police and fire um when somebody's out and they replace that's not necessarily an emergency response it's preparing for a potential emergency it's having the staffing to respond to what might come up it's not having an inadequate number of people to to make a response so you know there like i said there's sort of what happens when there's a call and people come out um 
what happens when it's snowing and people come out or versus, you know, like Ken mentioned, you know, you got so many people on duty, someone's on vacation, someone else comes in to fill that shift so they can make those calls. And that's, that's a different kind of emergency, but the bulk of it is in our emergency services and, and, and DPW and water is DPW as well. So um, we have very little overtime in other departments. I mean, maybe the occasional somebody's over an extra hour, but even then we usually have them flex it or comp it, not take it as overtime. Bill, um, the change you just announced of scheduling in DPW, are we figuring that that will reduce overtime? Yes. Um, to a, Yes, definitely, because there will be six people on duty from 11 to 7, so if there's anything, any water breaks overnight, any uh, sewer, you know, any issues that we now call DPW out for, they'll already be here and be able to respond. Um, but the, the amount of savings is it's difficult, like it depends how many storms we have and how many water breaks are, right? So if we get lucky and there's no other weather event between now and April and there's no other water break, then we've just got a bunch of folks working overnight that didn't save any overtime because we wouldn't have called, there was no one to call out. I, I wouldn't bet on that here in Vermont in January. So yes, we will save overtime on those calls. We'll save overtime right now. Uh, snow removal, particularly in downtown, is a full overtime operation costs three or $4,000 to do. This should be able to be done by this crew. Um, but you don't want to, and so I think in terms of efficiency, that's great. And I, but I do want to mention in, in, you know, to the, the point of the DPW guys who were there and the, the police folks, you know, um, we are trying to make this more efficient and the, the, to the extent that people are willing to work this out with us and understand, you know, that's money that they make. So they're, they're taking, you know, less in their pocket. Now I think, some extent they're trading um they're trading maybe convenience or fatigue or, or whatever uh, and again fortunately it was voluntary uh, in dpw but and it's been voluntary in police but so you know people people our staff is making sacrifices too and when you heard that the folks from dpw and the folks from fire you know these these people care and all of our staff does and um so nobody's trying to milk the system it's just it's how it's built we could we couldn't if we put enough people in so that we didn't have overtime, the budget, you know, to, nobody would like that budget and the number of employees we had. You know, we were, we were looking, um, particularly like at fire, um, you know, some of the places that have less overtime, you know, Williston, South Burlington, they staff six or seven at a time on shift. Burlington has 10 or 12 on, on at a time. You know, we're running three or four. Same with Barry. And so our overtimes are higher because we have to call the people in. Um, so, you know, we're, we're making it up on one end and paying it at the other end. Um, you know, Barry Police Department is 21 or two people. We have 16. So we're we're managing things differently. So if we add five more police officers, it's going to be a heck of a lot more than the overtime total. So, you know, I mean, that's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Palin. So, but I'm not saying we can't do this. I'm just saying overtime. Over, uh, I'm not trying to say. We shouldn't be talking about it. I'm trying to say that to deliver the services that we deliver over time is a necessary part of the function. It isn't necessarily a bad thing in and of itself. It's can we be better at it? Can we schedule smarter? Sure. And we're, we're all constantly trying to do that, but we can't. And and it, it certainly jumps out in this budget because we right-sized the number in the budget this year. And so it popped out and it's really is a, you know, we we were substantially over budget last year, and a large part of it was the overtime that was under budgeted and overspent. So yes, so there's a combination of getting the right number in the budget and doing the right job of managing it, and that is art, not science. So I just want to be sure, like Lauren said, after I heard from you, it is not a good idea. To cut that i i know that you cannot say like strictly black or white right you cannot say yes or no what is the general idea to vote on this should i understand that this is not a good move in the long run right because well, you said we overspent last year from overtime 
which might happen this year too. So we should be careful uh, taking this money out, right? Correct. But yeah, we've also you. substantially changed the, the overall total. I mean, as Sal mentioned, it was up two hundred eighty-two thousand dollars. So this would be it would still be up two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. So I I, I want to say this. I can't tell you whether this is a good move or a bad move. I can tell you it's going to have an impact on our services to some extent. We we don't know. But this is this is so I think knowing that it's going to have an impact on our service, you all need to make the decision about how much, you know, what the tax rate is you're willing to support. This is one of those decisions that is a value proposition. Um, you know, is it more important to have some extra in here? Or is it more important to try to keep the tax rate back at the 3.93? Uh, and and that's, uh, you know, we'll we'll make it work however you decide it. Um, and you you will have done this with a full conversation that either you chose to have the tax rate be what it was, or you chose to skim back on this a little. And at some point when something isn't you know done this is a conversation that we had and you know, we we're always trying to work to have the best outcomes. You heard, you heard the DPW guys, we'll make it work. We'll, you know, um, but it's, it will be harder. So. Um, listening to this discussion, uh, it just seems to me that the, the, the example of that, and I, I don't have all the details, obviously just heard about it tonight, but the, the example of what was just, described to us in DPW was done because it, a need was felt. Something had had to change, and this was a solution that um, the DPW came up with uh, in conjunction with the administration, um, partly to, to, to save uh, wear and tear on people, partly to make the operation more efficient, but it was done basically because a need was perceived. Um, I'm simply suggesting that this $33,000 proposed cut in fiscal year 25 creates a need, wow. a similar need to manage in across the board uh, in, in a creative way as is being done in DPW. And we have, we have time between now and then to see how well this works. Uh, I think if you don't perceive the need you don't make the change. Just yes. So, and just to respond to that, I want to be clear that um, th we are trying this in DPW. We're going to reevaluate in the spring and see if it was a success or a failure. And so, but it's you know it's definitely driven by the actually by the financial situation we're in in this current fiscal year. Was you know we are really pulling out what we can do. So if it works, hopefully, and people are happy with it, hopefully we can continue, continue it into the future. Lauren. Well, I hope regardless of whether this motion passes or fails, I, I think the message has been clearly delivered. If there are places to cut, there's so many other things that we're also cutting in this budget that we would much rather be spending money on than overtime if there's ways to avoid overtime while delivering high quality critical services to the community. Um, I guess, are, like, are there in your mind other, not that that was necessarily low hanging fruit, but like the water plant or other kind of obvious next scheduling adjustments, like that's what it doesn't seem to me like with police and fire, that's harder to do, maybe the water plant. So I would feel better supporting this if, if it was like, well, yeah, we can also try this next at the water plant. And, um, you know, there's, there's some clear opportunities if it's just, a numbers game where we're doing it to cut the budget and then but we'll probably spend it. That's what I just want to avoid doing. Do you have an answer? Well, we can, we can look at it anywhere. Just be clear that the water plant is not this. This is our general fund. So, um, but, but we're, we, we, you know, we can look at that. I mean, again, I think it's one of those things you have someone come in on a Saturday for an hour when the rest of the time, when you have the full crew there, they can actually get work done. You know, do you have them spend a whole Saturday by themselves for what is essentially an hour's worth of work? It's it's actually probably more efficient to just pay them to do that hour's worth of work and be done with it. And does anyone else have anything to say? Are we ready to vote on Sal's motion? 
All right. Let's let's vote on. So, we're voting on what are we voting on? Pellin's amended we're, motion. We're vote, voting on the motion is to amend Pellin's motion to uh, cut thirty three thousand dollars out of okay overtime. Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, Bait. No. Brown. We're waiting for you to be. And once you're unmuted, if you can keep yourself unmuted, that'd be great. Okay. No. Alfano. No. Yes. Uh, Heaney. Yes. Cone. Yes. Hurl. No. And the mayor votes yes. So we've amended the motion to add a $33,000 cut. Now we're back to the main motion as amended, and it's now $88,000. It's uh, exactly the same, uh, and the motion is to cut uh, $50,000 from the Housing Trust, Trust Fund, $5,000 from legal and $33,000 from overtime to uh, offset the uh, fire department position. <laughs> Is there uh, further discussion we'd like to have on that? Lauren. Can, you've been, Mr. Mayor, our liaison on the Housing Trust Fund for a long time. Could you just describe like what we would be forgoing if we cut that 50,000? I know we just recently, for example, approved 9,000 for being able to do housing for a refugee family in town. Like what are the kinds of projects we're not going to be able to do if we cut this? Well, over the years, what we've done with the housing trust fund is we've used it for essentially two things. One has been to uh, pro provide work on projects or programs like the uh, first time home buyer program that's been able to uh, provide some down payment assistance for people uh, for buying homes in the city. Um, the other thing, and I don't, I'm not sure if we're doing that right at the moment, uh, but, uh, but we have done that in the past. The other thing that we've done is use that money in the trust fund to build up a, a fund that we could then use to be <laughs> match to, uh, to be a contribution to um, development programs or projects like some of the funding for uh, to analyze Country Club Road or some of the money that went into the uh, French block, some of the money that went into uh, 58 Barry Street, is it? The uh, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and some of it went into the Taylor Street uh project yeah and it's all been i think it's all been to downstreet but it's been uh very useful because what i'm told that i'm not an expert in affordable housing uh development and financing but what i i'm told by people who are is that um when all these funders you know these developing these pro projects is very complicated and there's a dozen or, or more funding sources to, that that all come into these projects and you know including community development money from the state and uh tax credit money and a, and a bunch of other stuff and they consistently say that having some city money in the in the project is a plus factor and it enables the uh it helps the to bring all the other funding sources together. And so it's it's very important to have that uh, money there to do that. Now, right now, I don't know exactly how much we have in the trust fund. It's a couple of hundred thousand dollars, I think. You have the exact number, sir? Okay. 200,000 exactly, or? Yeah, Sarah's going to get us the real number. So, yeah. And there's not a project that is 
like in the wings waiting to go on stage and happen. So even though I've been someone who's been really housing, housing, housing all the way, if we if we took this 50,000, Sarah. Okay. 76,000 for those that didn't. So if I'm we sorry. put $50,000 into it this year, that wouldn't, in my judgment, it wouldn't significantly reduce our ability to put money into future projects. Donna. We don't know what projects are going to come up. Right. And I feel that housing is our priority. We should keep building that the same way we constantly have the steady state for our infrastructure. So I oppose taking it out of housing. I oppose taking it out of overtime. Hence, I won't vote for this motion. Okay. And, and then the other thing about it is that... Uh, I forget what I was going to say, but uh, Carrie, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm I'm pretty uncomfortable with this as well because housing is one of our priorities, and because I'm not sure, um, well, because you know we're not funding it at what the the they've asked us for. However, um, knowing how much is in there at this point, and knowing the kinds of things that we've spent money on in the in the past, in the several recent years, um, if something like the French Block came along, or Taylor Street, or something like that, that required a, a significant investment of you know hundred thousand or one hundred twenty five thousand, we would be able to do it right now. And so, while I'm not happy about it, I I'm okay with this as um, as a, a measure to reduce this year. Helen. So I'm also not happy like proposing this, but at the same time, we need to offset this firefighter position. And it is important to, you know, add this position without creating more burden on taxpayers because we uh, heard, I think it was Carol, if I'm wrong, please, um, you know, understand me. She mentioned that like this tax increase affects vulnerable people. So, and we want to have this firefighter, like I think three years ago or four years ago, I had a very, very bad asthma attack and I went to my doctor's office and because it was the beginning of COVID and I was coughing, couldn't breathe. And they said, okay, we cannot do anything uh for you because it might be COVID. so just put your mask that and please drive to the hospital and i said i cannot drive because i cannot breathe like what what if something happens to me <laughs> and they said okay we will call um ambulance and i was waiting there and ambulance was there like <clears throat> in two or three minutes but for me that three minutes was 300 years because I couldn't breathe. Like I was just like, my husband was not here in another city. My kids are at school and I was all alone. Didn't know, but the ambulance came, they took me. They was very, they were very nice and I felt safe. So that's why this is like very important for us to have enough number of firefighters because most of the time they mentioned they go and do like ambulance and like they deal with patients. But at the same time, we don't want to create more tax increase. Yes, there is already a tax increase and people were waiting for this, right? Because even survey results showed us that, yeah, we shouldn't have cuts in these three core departments. But at the same time, we are okay with manageable tax increase. So that's why, yeah, if it's a normal time, normal conditions, I wouldn't offer, let's take this 50,000 from housing trans fund, but this year budget, I think we have to make this difficult decision. So thank you. Thanks, Bellin. One One of the questions that occurs to me is that, you know, I was uh, the chair of the housing task force for years and, and we, had years where we had to, we were coming into the council and fighting back against cuts uh, to the housing trust fund. And uh, and I think we had some discussion about, well, is it, 
would it be better to even cut it to a dollar than to cut it to zero? Because uh, that way we retain that line in the budget. And, and I don't really know the answer to that. Maybe Sarah or, or Bill knows the answer to that. I think we're at a different place in the public uh, discussion of, uh, of our housing needs in Montpelier. And I think that there's, it's it's not as it's it's the value is is shared more broadly across the council than it than it has been in previous years. But Sarah, do you? Yeah, um, I don't think you lose it if it comes out of the budget entirely this year. I think it is a priority to you all, and if that remains a priority, it would be something that would be put back. It wouldn't be lost sight of just because it comes out of the twenty five budget. Okay, thanks, Carrie. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that this was the, my understanding is this came to be because of a city meeting vote in 2005, and so it, it's more it's it's more built in more securely I think than just the people who happen to be on the council at any given time. So so I don't feel as worried about it disappearing. I feel like we can make a cut for this year, but it still will, can remain a priority for us in the future. Anyone, Lauren. Yeah, I appreciate it. And the context is really helpful. I mean, I think this very well might pass and I feel better about it than I would have. I do remain concerned. Just, you know, Bill has made the point that it's not like the FY26 budget is going to be a bed of roses and we're cutting over and over and over all these priorities of ours being like, well, it's okay for this year. And I don't know how we're going to like claw back to being able to do things. And, you know, if even something like housing, which we've all identify every single one of us as a core priority and something we need to be investing in, like, you know, assuming this moves forward, just underscoring like this and many other things that we're cutting are really important. So like, how are we going to figure out how to build a budget next year? Yeah. <laughs> that Because we can't keep doing this year after year. And so it's just, you know, zeroing out all these priorities and expect progress on critical issues for the community. So just just another quandary we're in with this really yep. difficult budget. Yeah, I mean, my, my presumption, you know, assuming I'm here, uh, is that we would start by putting all those numbers back in that we cut, you know, at least as for our starting point and see what that looks like and share that with you just like we did and say, here's the struggle we're up against and get some guidance and work it from there. I don't think we would just zero them out because they were zeroed out this year. Um, the other possibility and I, you know, um, is, you know, we also cut it in this present year because that's part of our budget rescission. And, you know, depending if we got state state money, you know, maybe we could put 50,000 of that into the fund as a one-time expense to at least if that was a, depending on where else we put it, um, you know, what else we need. Um, we, we have a lot of needs, but I'm just saying that. Right. What, but, it, but I mean, it could be, it could be on your, maybe not yours, but I mean, it could be as we talk about where those funds could or could not be used. I mean, obviously we would probably put it into capital and equipment and de deficit reduction and all these other things, but um, yeah. But anyway, Okay, um, let, let's vote on this. I think I think we all know where we are. So I'm just going to do a roll call again. Uh, Bate, uh, Brown, aye. Alfano, aye. Heaney, yes. Cohn, yes. Pearl, no. Motion carries. Uh, six to two. I'm four to two. Sorry. Thank you. Um, Whoa. And we have a request at this point. We can, we'll take a 10 minute break. Thanks, Bill. And we are uh, continuing our deliberation of the fiscal 2025 uh, budget. Uh, Carrie. Yeah. So I was going back through um, looking at, any little things I could find. And and one of the things that I, I keep coming kind of coming back to is the city council budget, which has gone up almost eleven percent. And it seems like the the increase is coming from a line item of um, advertising. So I wanted to know more about what that is and wonder if that might be it's three thousand dollars was added 
and wonder if we might consider taking that three thousand dollars back out again, depending on what it's for. Thanks, Kerry. That's being looked looked into. We're checking now. We do have some advertisements, you know, all the legal ads and things that we have to do, uh, posting public hearings and those kind of things that come out of that. But I don't know. Sarah's on it now. Yeah, so this was bumped up because the actual in fiscal year 23 was about 3500 So that's why that line item was bumped up. So it was just bumped up to match the actual. And was it uh, unusually high because we had an unusual number of public hearings or something like it, something else that had to be more, more warnings than usual, maybe because the country club wrote, I don't know. Come under council cost? The advertisement part. I mean, yeah, the, planning stuff comes out, the planning stuff comes out of the planning budget, I believe. Uh, Mike's, yeah, but... But also, the like we put an ad in with the agendas and all that kind of stuff. I, I want ads. Agenda. I just didn't think about ads. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So some of them are in the manager's budget and some are in council budget. So council meeting here, warnings. So clarification, it, it was $1,000 in years past, but we overspent by three and a half times. That's what we're checking, yeah. And and it was solely on warnings. That's what we're, legal we're just numbers? looking right now. Oh, Sarah's digging furiously in her computer, burrowing into the hole. All of the expenses are for the Times Argus. Um, but I, I can't tell exactly what without drilling into each one. But there are several expenses to the Times Argus. So it was all to the paper, Times Argus for advertisement. So we'll have to we'd have to dig further to see where. Those exactly where are we? We can see the invoices, but we can't see what they're for. Okay. So one of the, if I could continue, um, sure. one of the things that has come up a lot in the discussions that I've heard in the public about the bridge expenses is that people have been saying that the city is paying for something similar in the Times Argus for a lot less money. Um, and I don't know exactly what that is, and I and I don't know how much money that is, and I wonder if you could tell us more about that, Bill. I can, and Evelyn can help too. So it's $3,000. It's a monthly page, and we've used it differently than the article. It's been more of a, you know, kind of more graphics and more, you know, up announcements about things going on and those kind of things. And part of our thought was if we discontinued the bridge, we might put more narrative into it like we used to with the bridge. I agree it's not as good as the bridge in terms of reaching people, but um yeah, the, again, the information we had at the time was it was 14000 for the bridge versus 3000 and we have Evelyn to do her magic, so. And Carrie, it sounds like you have a number of things to go over, and you should just consider that you have the floor and keep... Okay. No, that, I mean, that was really the, the big one. Um, I think that I... I know that $3,000 doesn't make a tremendous difference to the bottom line, but just in the interest of looking for ways that we can cut a little bit of expenses here and there without cutting essential services, um, I guess I'd like to move that we discontinue that $3,000 in Times Argus advertising. Um, so that's the uh, the public notices that we were just no, been talking about no the 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 column the the column okay that's informational that's you know just a communication strategy and that we instead try to make better use of our website and front porch forum and other things like that that aren't going to uh, incur that particular expense i know it will i know it impacts the communications functions i know it's it's not without impact but i think maybe this is a way we can absorb it Okay. Is there a second? Um, so since we are talking about like communication with public, um, I think we should find a way to keep a Montpelier Bridge page. Um, I don't want to make um, like more difficult decisions, but if we can find some way to keep it next year, 
not including it on the budget will be great because so many people are benefiting from their um, services for free. Like I remember their presentation and everything. So it is important uh, for our community to be informed. So I don't know if there's any plan or if we can make it happen. Is there any like a tiny little, because now we were uh, talking about cutting uh, term Argus, then suddenly we are not um, <clears throat> giving that much information to a uh, paper. So I just want to learn if there's any chance for the uh, bridge. Thank you. Well, I'd say if we cut 3,000 from the Times Argus and the bridges drop their price to 9,500, you would have to add 6,500 to the budget somewhere or then cut somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That's the net of what's left. No, there's not a second. Uh, there's not a second yet. Is there a second on Carrie's proposal? Uh, I'll second. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, that that's definitely a way to do. And there's an argument. Well, six thousand dollars is better than the three thousand for the Times Argus because it reaches everybody in the city, and uh, nobody has to pay to get it. Um, Donna, by the same token, the information can be read on the website. We could post articles in the library. The library does get the Times Argus. I believe it also gets the bridge. So the public does have access to those papers. Right now, I'd rather cut both of them than either one. Okay. Any other comments on uh, Carrie's motion before we vote on it? Okay. The motion is to cut out the... Uh, Three thousand uh, dollar monthly page to the uh, Montpelier Bridge. We'll start on this end. Uh, well, the time's already. Time's Sorry, thank you for the correction, uh, Pearl. Phone. Yes. Amy. Yes. Alfano. Yes. Brown. Yes. Bait. Yes. Motion carries. That $3,000 is out. Any other discussions or ideas that anyone has? I know that, uh, Carrie, a little while ago, you said, well, can't we just throw out a whole bunch of ideas and talk about them? So, Tim, maybe that... That's what you're planning. Totally, totally diversion ideas. You'll probably fall off your chairs, but one might be an increase um, that I'd propose. So, but I, the uh, one thing that's occurred to me is thinking through this budget process this weekend is we haven't talked about resiliency at all post flood. Is there any funding within this budget to support the resiliency commission or for flood resiliency? Uh, there is, and I mean, Kevin asked either, but. Um, but there isn't. There, there's none specifically, yeah, no. Assume that. Right, no. yeah, no. <laughs> Which is embarrassing. Yeah. Lauren, do you have anything to add to that, being a member of the commission? I mean, it's a great question. I think both the commission is hoping to put forward a number of ideas over the course of the year, would hope that the city would be kind of partnering on things and looking for opportunities, some of which might cost some money. I think there's also a recognition of what a challenging budget year and there's some really good fundraisers on that <laughs> commission, for example. So I think the ability to try to see if there's other ways to raise funds or get projects started and then look at the next year's budget or something. So I think we might miss opportunities or something, but yeah, there's not, there's nothing like tangible right now that will definitely require a city expenditure that we know about at the moment that's like a clear missed opportunity, but it, it was more like there's a whole bunch of ideas kind of in development that will come before us and we'll just have to see if there's anything we could do at that point. And yeah, Tim. I don't think when it was established, we were partners at the table and agreed to support it. And um, I don't like to go against what I feel 
I thought we agreed to. Yeah. Um, and even if it's administrative support or something, we may need to find some way to assist this because I think it's really critical um, work that we need to be doing and they're doing. So. Just, just on that, I mean, I know we're going to get to, and like we have many, many, many competing needs, but like with some of the state money that's coming in because of the flood, um, if the state, for example, you know, is putting some money into impacted residents and stuff, we've we've got the FEMA money. Like, I think there's a few pots of money we could potentially look at as setting aside some chunk. Um, and I think I would wholeheartedly support that if there's some opportunity. Are, they, are the, are the uh, applications for executive directors still open? They are. Anyone interested in applying, please uh, check it out. MontpelierStrong.org. You can learn more. Thanks. Tim, I think you're on, you had other things. The thing I've brought up before is I still am struggling with the country club. And, and I know you think I'm short sighted with it, Jack, but I think it's, I'm looking at this thing going, we're having trouble funding basics. We haven't funded any thing to help us move ahead with that project in this budget. There's no money for the engineering or the basic work we really need to be doing if we're going to move ahead with this. So we've got a $3 million investment that we've paid money to carry. We're paying about 160 something thousand a year in bond payments to fund that at the moment, 160, 167. We're paying the utilities for the taxes and the heat. We're mowing a lot of lawns. We're paying for insurance and the net result in the rents we're collecting is bug dust. You know, it's not a couple thousand a year or whatever in, in that budget. It, it's it's going to cost us continuously in this range because every year there's a surprise. This year we had the environmental work up there that was 40 something thousand. And in a property that big, that's not uncommon to experience that. I just look at we're going to be down a couple hundred thousand a year or more every year carrying this till we get to a place where we can really do something with it. Um, I'm struggling with that seeing when we're talking about not funding resiliency commissions and and the the um, you know all the all the folks that help us in so many other ways that we want to fund it, it's it just doesn't I think we're on the wrong track with it and I don't see it coming up you know it's not even zoned for the use we want to use it for we're having to change our zoning um, so if anyone else bought this and wanted to build housing there right now they couldn't do what's proposed for that project we can't do it. We, you know, we're changing our own zoning. We're changing our own rules to be able to do it, which is really hypocritical. I do favor changing the zoning and making it so that it will accommodate housing, but I really don't think we should be doing it. And I think we should move forward. Um, and I make a motion that we propose taking steps to prepare to sell it. And part of those steps will be getting the zoning change in place, because I don't think it's going to have great value to a potential developer if it's not zoned to allow the housing we want built. Um, so you've made a motion. I'm trying to think, hmm. how does this fit within the budget? If since we're talking about the budget, what is the motion to uh, to amend the budget? So it's not going to add an immediate add back into the budget. It's, it depends on how long it takes to sell it, right? I don't know. It's an immediate impact. It'll have a long-term impact on our finances, but this year's general fund budget, I'm not sure. Bill, do you have well, if I may, I'm not to, I mean, you all do what you want, but next meeting, we're doing the outline of where we're at. So we're actually going to have on the agenda this topic, now the budget's over, to try to talk about some of those issues. So if we'll be asking for your guidance on whether we can move forward or sell or what do we do? So I'm not trying to tell you, you can't make your motion now. That's up to the mayor and everybody else. But it, it, that is abs it's our, our next meeting's agenda once we get past this. So no money in this budget to support moving it. So that is true. And let me, I'll say this again. Um, when we presented the budget, prepared the budget at that point, we were, we had a lease for $1.1 $1 .1 million dollars of which we needed about 800,000 for a water line. And so our plan was that the excess would fund the type of work that was going to be done. So we felt we did have a funding source that would address those needs without having to add the tax rate to do it. We since got 513,000 and my suggestion was let's use it for the property. And we didn't make a decision on that. 
and that we heard a lot of good arguments. But, you know, we could, even if we chose to use some of that for flood resiliency, we could also, you know, we could allocate half of that to this project and half of it to flood resiliency, and I think both projects would be better off. You know what I mean? So so there is that $500,000, but um, waiting to be allocated. So, the, I mean, from from my perspective and our team's perspective, that was the funding where we were going to get the funding. And I realized 1.1 turned into half of that. And then we heard about other needs. We also know, I mean, I think the budget adjustment act has a fair amount of money in it for individuals. Um, so hopefully the city won't be in a position to be asked for that. I mean, it isn't really our role, but so, I mean, there, there are potential funding sources without raising taxes for them is all I'm saying. It's up to you guys to do it, but it's, we didn't completely ignore that. We, we were in, you know, I think, yeah. If you go back to my presentation under the housing, it said lease revenue available um, for, but anyway, that was our plan right from the get go. Um, was how we were going to fund that. So no. So we've got a motion is a little vague, exactly what the motion is, but the question is, is there a second? Okay. So we could take steps to prepare to sell the country's club road property, uh, which make changes to the zone. Thanks, that sound right. That sounds like good what I heard. Okay, I'm not seeing a second. Let's keep moving on. Um, does anyone else have any other proposals for uh, additions or subtractions from uh, the budget as it's before us now? And we're a little bit lower than where we were at the end of last week. So Three point nine one. Yeah. Just kind of process confusion for me, and I'm sorry, but this is my first time through this drill. But so I'm still not sure because this this isn't the whole budget in the sense that we're not talking about capital fund, you know. And I know it's been brought up that we need the new ladder truck. We lost a fire truck in a fire recently, and we've heard nothing about that. Um, and you know, we have responsibilities to buy the equipment for the basic pieces. It, it hasn't been part of this process, so I'm, I'm a little confused and disillusioned. Um, so, um, so the capital fund is part of this budget, and it's the 2.4 million that's part of this budget that's approved. And we we met that. Uh, um, we are planning for the so the the ladder truck would be a bond, and we will be planning that in the future years when that comes. Uh, and we've been, I think that's been delayed basically to, there's a, a grant, a, a potential grant available, it pays about half of that. So uh, you, have, but you have to be to 25 or 30 years old, 30, you have to be 30 to be eligible. So we've been trying to get it to that because these are one and a half million dollar pieces of equipment. So if we get 750,000 to pay for it, it's, it's worth it. With regard to the fire truck, we've been waiting for insurance settlement, which we've just sort of got. And we're now, you know, seeing what we can do. But if you want to, sure. Yep. So for insurance money for the fire truck, we received about three hundred sixteen thousand. We haven't actually received it, but I expect to next week. Um, there is some debt associated with that truck that will need to be paid back. Um, so I think we will probably net two hundred thousand um, towards a new truck. Um, and in the capital funding, we did plug a fifty thousand dollar spot for additional funding to go towards a, a new truck or a used truck or whatever we deem would be appropriate to replace that truck. Um, and the contents on the truck, we will receive full funding for replacement of through insurance. So now we're sort of shopping for used trucks. So we'll come back to you when, once we have something to propose, but it's, it hasn't been forgotten. So sorry if we haven't kept you. We just got the insurance number the last couple of days. So capitalist. Same thing. I mean, yeah. we, we've got it. It's it's been it's in the plan. So. And as I recall, from a couple of months ago, there were a couple of fire departments around Vermont who were potentially interested in selling us 
used trucks. I'm not sure where things stand on that. I think we would probably look wider than just Vermont. So, and you know, that's not a lot of money for a fire truck. So we got to figure this one out. Mm -hmm. And we'll come back to you with a plan when we have one. Are we ready to vote on the entire budget at this level? I'm not hearing any. Oh, Carrie. I'll just, just a reminder that um, I'd like to request that we split the budget into two portions so that the city clerk budget is separate from the rest of the budget. So I can recuse myself from that because I'm married to the city clerk and I have a financial interest in that budget. I can hold up my page that says, okay. Carrie, pull out clerk's budget. I've got that uh, ready to go, yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So how do you make a motion? Does the motion have to have the amount in it? I, to exclude the clerks from the amount that I'm looking at on the screen. Just, I would say just move the budget as adjusted today minus the clerk's portion. Yeah. And that should cover it. Yeah. And then there would be a separate motion to fund the clerk at the, uh, at the recommended level. I'll make the motion that will fund the budget as presented and amended and amended mm -hmm. separate from the clerk's city clerk's office portion is there a second i'll second all right is there any more discussion or are we ready to vote okay i'm going to try it this way all those in favor signify by saying aye Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay. Pearl. Tone. Yes. Heaney. No. Alfano. Yes. Brown. Yes. And Bate. Okay. The motion carries. Now, do you want to make the second half of that motion? <laughs> I'll make the motion that we pass the city clerk's portion of the budget. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Um, am I an abstention? I'm recusing myself completely, so I guess that counts as an abstention. Yeah. I wonder if this counts as a split vote where we need a roll call. Okay. She, okay, good. Okay. So there we have it. We have a budget. And that is the amount going to uh, to the voters on on uh, March fifth. Thank you. So when we get to the warning item, we'll just have to. I think we'll get the new number here before spreadsheet. Yeah, <laughs> it lets us know where we are. I, I just have to thank staff. You've all been immensely helpful. Yeah, thank you for this work. This is this has been great and. And having this uh, spreadsheet that enables us to do all this stuff and have people see it is really uh, tremendously beneficial. So great work, everybody. All right. Next up, we have the annual warning, and we have the second public hearing. So I will open the public hearing. We all have copies of the warning in front of you. And uh, again, Article 4 will have to change slightly, uh, and we'll have that number for you shortly. And the school did approve their budget last week, so that is the amount that they've asked to have put on. The only question I had, actually, is I was looking at it tonight, and some I just don't know the answer to this, so I'm hoping. Um, did CVHHH petition, or did we say as long as they kept the same amount, they'd go on the city council? That. And both of our understandings were that it was the 
standing will of the council okay. that they would both be put on at the same level. That's I just couldn't remember um, what we had decided. So, so with the, so that, that is correct. That's I'm not going to swear to that. They didn't that. give you a petition. It's because no, we they did not. And Sarah and I just had this conversation like today. That's all. <laughs> I think that's right, but I just wanted to be sure. It's really, like it really petition, funny. I wanted to make sure it's in petition. Yeah. So it's not going to say by petition. Right. Got it. Okay. Beautiful. All right. Any uh, comments from members of the public of the uh, city warning as drafted? I'll and the sure only, just for the public's benefit, the only items that are not, I guess I'd say business as usual, and even these are, is the petitioned article for the Calicabra Library, the article for the Vermont Health and Hospice, and then the petition charter change for uh, just cause evictions that we heard about earlier tonight. Everything else are the standard articles which are on each year. Seeing none, I am going to close the public hearing. Is there a motion to approve the... Hold on. Uh, Hold on. Oh. We need to amend Article 4. So Article 4, the um, taxes to be raised should be $11,860,353. This is a $91,000 reduction from the amount previously on the warning. Yep, uh, eleven million eight hundred and sixty thousand three hundred and fifty three dollars. All right. Is there a motion to approve the warning uh, as amended? The amendment was changing the number for the amendment. Does that need to have a motion? I think it's just. Go ahead. We accept the city warning for March. 5th, 2024, with the additional amount of the $11,860,353 on Article 4. Is there a second? Any discussion? Uh, Carrie, are you abstaining uh, or recusing yourself from this too? Uh, I don't think I need to because I don't think there's any financial connection here so okay unless, it, unless someone disagrees I'm, i don't okay. disagree all those okay. in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. Opposed? okay motion carries next up proposed unified development regulations mike is Stuck it out, and you you get to come up and tell us about it, and I think that's great. Preview of coming attraction. It's just a prep for next week's public hearing. Quick, quick heads up on the zoning changes that you're going to be talking about next week. Good evening. I am Mike Miller. I'm the planning director for the city. And give me one moment. Yeah, I was just waiting in the back there in case they change their minds. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants to be here to watch the zoning. It, it's done. It's not subject to a revote. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming. I mean, you're welcome to stay. Don't get me wrong, guys. <laughs> yeah. Bob's still here. That's the Bob still here. If they try to change the fire budget. Thanks. Thank you all. All right. So uh, I'm just going to go through this relatively quickly. Um, this is an introduction to the amendments for the zoning and river hazard regulations. Um, so I'm going to really quickly go through some process um, where you all can find the proposals online or anyone in the public. Really briefly just describe what the changes are so you know kind of what to look for. 
uh, in the Unified Development Regulations, which is more commonly known as the Zoning Bylaws, and the River Hazard Amendments. Then we'll have some next steps, and I'll take whatever questions you have. So what we will be having are two hearings over two nights, although we're going to combine the two hearings into one. Um, each to, to amend the Unified Development Regulations requires a hearing, and to do the, the river hazard requires its own public hearing. So we usually put those two together into a single hearing, but just to be technical and legal and official, they are worn separately, um, but we'll probably talk about them at the same time. And the two hearings that we have warned in the papers for are for February 14th, which is the next meeting, the next regular council meeting, and February 28th. And you are always welcome to have additional hearings if you guys want to. There's just a requirement under state law to have two hearings. So these are the two hearings that we have scheduled. Um, yep. So you're going right into zoning changes but we haven't updated our master plan at all, right? Correct. There's no requirement to have all uh, things change. Um, the master plan, uh, the city plan, well, it's currently called the master plan, so we'll use master plan. Um, it has uh, an eight year expiration, so it's still good through the end of 2025. So the zoning bylaws must be um, in conformance with the master plan. And that's kind of a general uh, legal term um, and we can go into more detail with that if people want to, but uh, we regularly make amendments to our zoning within this seven year. In fact, we've probably amended it five times now since 2018. Um, and this will be one more set that we'll go through. Um, so where to find the proposals? Uh, if you go to the front, Front page, main page of our city website, you will you can scroll down and you'll see popular links. On the right hand side at the top, you'll see zoning and floodplain regulations. If you were to click on that box, it would take you to this page, which has draft zoning regulations. These are red line strikeout versions, um, draft river hazard regulations, which I believe just have it highlighted because there are only like four changes. So we've highlighted where those changes are. There's a draft zoning map which isn't redlined. I'll have to point out where the zoning, where the map changes are, but there aren't a lot. And then the list of zoning changes is actually an Excel table. It has some things that um, the Planning Commission voted to change, some things they voted not to change. So it does have a mix of everything, but it has one column which describes what was proposed and why it was um, changed and then what was done. And some most of them on the right-hand side, you'll see done, which means they were voted on. So um, the map changes, there are really um, four map changes that are gonna be in the zoning map. Uh, really quick, uh, there's a map change for 155 Northfield Street, uh, the red circle there. That was a piece of uh, property that used to be owned by National Life. It was sold for a daycare. Um, so if you're familiar with going up Northfield Street, there's a daycare that operates out of there. They now own that property. So we are rezoning it to match Northfield Street as opposed to being part of Western Gateway. It actually makes the, the property easier for them to continue to get permits and make amendments. Um, the second set, um, which I'll show you really quickly after this slide, uh, Country Club Road, we've got a proposal to accommodate the redevelopment in the approved plan. Again, we'll be talking about this in two, twice, really, next meeting on the 14th, because we'll talk about Country Club Road work plan as well as the zoning uh, that would be needed to accommodate it. There's a really small change on 29 Sibley. I just pointed out because it is a zoning change for a property on 29 Sibley where somebody bought a part of another parcel and then did a boundary line adjustment. And then finally, there's a Home Act changes to residential 24,000 district. So the Home Act passed last year in the legislature. Most of our bylaws already conform to the Home Act. Actually, most of the Home Act was actually written, modeled after the zoning changes that we had made in 2018. So we were pretty much in conformance with the exception of one zoning district, and I will go into that. Um, so here we've got, again, really a little bit difficult to find yourself with these because it's just a, zone, a, a clip of the zoning map. That number two is over the roundabout on Route 2 and 302. So this is the Country Club property. 
the proposal is to make the lower part, this is uh, the area where the Country Club building is and all those lower fields, to rezone that urban center one. And we'll go into it more detail later. The reason generally is just that we own the property and we're going to be negotiating it. So we will go through and, and um, be able to put in the most flexible zoning. So that was why we looked at that. Yes. Urban Center One's downtown zoning. It is the downtown zoning. So the the master plan that was uh, the the actionable master plan talked about five story buildings. We have one zoning district that allows five story buildings. We'll get into this a little bit more when we talk about the Country Club Road project, what the plan is going forward. But um, the the twenty second version is the planned outline is to go through and do an RFI and find a developer to develop the lower part. We would then negotiate a development agreement with them. They would then have the flexibility to design a project that fits the actionable master plan and what the city council wants to see down there. Um, by rezoning it, because we own it, we can rezone it very flexibly to give ourselves a lot of opportunities. We don't box ourselves in. Like you would somebody else, I get it. Yeah. If we were going to sell it, if the proposal was to sell it, I would not be recommending we put it in as Urban Center 1 just because we're kind of really putting it out there without any restrictions. So the, the reason this proposal is what it is is because we're following under the assumption until such time changes that we are working in a development agreement. We're going to find a developer and we're going to do a development agreement. So we've made very flexible zoning that we will then work with a developer on and then adjust at some point in the future when it becomes when it gets to be sold we will adjust the zoning probably to create its own zoning district but it was really hard for me to create a new brand new zoning district for a development project that i don't know what the developer is going to want to propose and what city council is going to want to support so by making urban center one we're pretty much giving the city council a blank slate to kind of go and work with um, the developers with to come up with the best proposal for this site um, the 9-9 that's above it, and again, these are all proposals. They can change. These are what Planning Commission staff has recommended. Planning Commission has uh, voted to support, and you will have rights to change them later. The upper area that's 9-9 .9 is basically rezoning the upper portion to be residential 3,000. Um, we don't have any proposals to develop that yet, but we are in here, and so we know that the master plan does describe that actionable master plan does describe that as uh, lower density housing so three residential 3000 would be the appropriate district um in the right hand picture is really just a zoom in this is this is a piece of property near sabin's pasture this gray line here is sabin's is sibley that sabin street so at the intersection there was a parcel somebody bought a little piece of this parcel and merged it with their own parcel so rather than have half of the half of his really tiny lot be in Riverfront and half of it to be in Res 6000, we put them all in Res 6000. So that's just to one of the other changes. The final map changes um, are the Home Act changes, and under the Home Act, there's a requirement that says if you've got sewer and water, you have to allow five units per acre. This area has sewer and water, and it is zoned at one third acre zoning. So it would have to be rezoned to residential 9,000 in order to comply. So that's the proposal here is to make it to conform. The other text changes, and I'll just roll through these real quick. Um, these are also to address the Home Act, which is what we just talked about eliminating residential 24,000, move them to res nine. And technically res nine will become one unit per 8,712, which is five units per acre. Um, the planning commission routinely has brought up a number of housing and density recommendations to try to go and um, make uh, more opportunity for housing to happen. So the changes that they have put in for this one, uh, one set is to go change the use table to add in, uh, divide multifamily into two. Um, so that way, instead of having just five or more as multifamily, there'd be two and the, the smaller multifamilies would be a little bit easier to permit. 
Um, we created a few more congregate housing types because they're just one, and we wanted to try to al allow for more opportunities in congregate housing. On the right-hand side, uh, if you're familiar with the zoning, you know that we have a rule that says if you've got a conforming lot, you can have a duplex, regardless of the density. The Planning Commission has recommended that we bump that up to four units. So if you have a conforming lot, you can have four units. You still have to meet the other requirements, so you still have to have parking. But um, as far as density goes, we're not going to go and um, uh, look at density for anything as four units or less. And then finally, uh, there's a recommendation. This has come up a number of times. Where we we're looking at removing density requirements. We already don't have density in Urban Center 1, Urban Center 2, Urban Center 3. And we had a review from um, Congress for New Urbanism and AARP, and they recommended that, you know, if we have good design review rules, we can remove density. So they are recommending that anything within the design review overlay district not have a maximum residential density. Mike, if I'm not mistaken, that's one of the proposals that came to us a year or two ago that uh, there was a split on the Planning Commission, and we decided that that wasn't quite ready for prime time. Is that right? They chose different ones last time. They did Riverfront, which had some of it in design review and some of it not in design review. So they've decided to kind of focus on if the design review rules are good and um, – then we really don't need to be looking at much strictly on for residential density um, because we are going to be looking at the overall appearance of the building. Its size and massing are still regulated. So it is a slightly different recommendation than last time. Um, the other changes, um, if you're looking through, there's um, major changes to the demolition provisions based on a court case. The city had to go to court on, a, on an appeal. Um, we're back. We asked before to remove the solar access and shading requirements that did not make it through. Planning Commission has put it back on for reconsideration. Um, we, I can talk about that more on the 14th. Um, we're adjusting boundary line adjustments, taking it out of subdivision, putting it into 3125. That'll make the process administrative. We get a lot of these. There's no reason to have a public hearing. Make them administrative. Um, we'll make the interim emergency housing provisions that you passed. We'll make those permanent. Um, we go through, there's a lot of typos, technical revisions um, that you can see in the strikeout as you go through. Um, and then there are three changes which were not in the Planning Commission version that have come up since the Planning Commission hearing has ended. Uh, they are also on that table, and I can add them once we have a meeting. You guys can tell me to put them in or not. One is there's just flat out a mistake. One of the recommended changes is actually wrong. It talks about um, the former CCV in this district, in the, in the uh, neighborhood that is um, on Upper Elm Street, and it's not the former CCV. So I don't know why that was put in there, but it is still CCV. So um, we have to strike that, but I can't do that without letting you know uh, there was a mistake and we have to fix it. Yeah. Um, there was. It probably said originally the former Woodbury College. Woodbury <laughs> College. That was my thought. And I'm like, I don't know why, but we will get that fixed. Um, a concerned citizen definitely was very, very concerned that something had happened to CCV. And I was like, no, 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 nothing's happened. Um, there, there's a technical fix to 3002 that was pointed out. Um, that is the one we had just talked about of if you're in the design review district, you'd be exempt from density requirements. Capital complex is not in the design review district. So if we went forward with that proposal, we should add capital complex in as well. Um, and that was a good catch by my zoning administrator on that. And we also have a proposal, which we'll have to talk a little bit more, which is about delayed projects. And this is um, came in because of the flood and because of COVID, we had a number of permits that have been issued. And there's a requirement in zoning that you have to complete development within two years. So one proposal we have is, first of all, we're going, we want to say you have two years to commence development, and then you have some time to complete it. Um, because a lot of times you might get your permit and you need to go through Act 250, you might need financing. And oh, by the way, we just had COVID and we just had a flood. So we want to adjust the language of that to open the door to say, if you've got permits that were issued since, um, 
I think it, I think it says January 2020 that those permits will remain valid for another period of time. Just because we we've had some developers come in and say my permits are expiring. I can't get another extension because I already got an extension. Can I get an additional extension? And so, because we're here talking about the zoning, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, but I wanted to put that on your on, on to let you know it never was discussed at the planning commission level. So you will have to add that. So, river hazard, really quick. There's really the major change is just adding additional requirements for critical facilities. So. One of the one of the recommendations, and it's a strong recommendation that they have, is that we hold critical facilities to a higher standard, and they usually say you want them elevated above the 500-year floodplain instead of the 100-year floodplain, because your critical facilities, your police stations, your fire stations, not that we're building any right now, but if it comes up and we have a hospital or some other critical facility that comes in, it should be two feet above the 500-year floodplain as opposed to two feet above the 100-year floodplain. And that just makes it more consistent with what you'd see in federal regulations and recommendations. So that's what you see here. We don't have any other recommendations that have come out of any resiliency discussions. These are just some of uh, the, the ones that have come through. So... Most important, what are the next steps? Um, how we review this is is up to you guys. Uh, I have gone through sometimes, and we've gone th walked through a red line version from beginning to end. Um, sometimes we've just started with a summary like this and take questions. Sometimes we just focus on key policy questions. How we do this hearing and conversation is really up to you. Um, and, and I'll format my conversations however you like. Uh, the entire zoning and river hazard, this is the other piece I want to make sure you guys know, is open for change. So the this is open for amendment to you. It's not just the pieces here. If you're familiar with zoning and you're like, I've always wondered about this, can we make an adjustment to that? Technically, yes. Any substantial change to the zoning has to go back to the Planning Commission for them to provide you comments. They don't get to vote yes or no, but they get to provide you comments and say, we think that's a good idea or we think that's a bad idea. So. Uh, just so everybody is aware of the process in the big picture, um, because you have zoning in front of you, really anything is on the table for conversations. And if you have questions, uh, mmiller at montpelier-vt.org. Um, I've already been getting a couple of questions from the public. So if, if anyone on the council or anyone on the public has questions for me, I can certainly go through them. And that's it. Thanks, Mike. Um... I, th I think this is uh, all good to know. Um, I'm interested in hearing what other members of the council have to say. My thinking is that from being on the council, I see zoning changes tend to generate a fair amount of interest from the public, you know, because people, you know, it affects people's homes, it affects what people might plan to do with their, their land. So I think that you know, my instinctive reaction is to say going through the whole red line thing, maybe too much detail, but somewhere between what you did tonight and going through uh, the whole red line version might be the way to go. I don't know if what other people, what other people think. Tim, you, you use this stuff. Uh, probably more than some of us. I, I, I guess I'm still philosophically stuck on, we really didn't update the master plan five years ago. It was an administrative review. It it wasn't like what we went through five years before that. No, it wasn't like we went through five years before so that. It really hasn't it, been community's input and feedback in it. It was just kind of put through to keep it alive because you're going to do it every five years. Is that In the past, it was every five years. They changed it to every eight years. So it, it was last approved in December of 17. Yeah, it just seems like we're we're changing zoning on significant properties and actually spot zoning for the Country Club Road property. We really should be looking at that section of town, um, not really tied to ownership, but more toward coming up with the right plan and for the way our community wants to see this area grow and develop. Um, it just feels like skipping the master plan step is wrong. Do you know what the timeline is for the master plan? I know the commission's been working on it for years. 
Yeah, our, our plan is to have um, the public hearing process, not the public, well, the public input process um, with the planning commission is going to be starting. It was supposed to start this winter. We're looking at later this winter. Um, I'm hoping in the March, April that we can start. I've got to see what the time the timeline is for my consultants on getting going. We did get another grant approved in the fall, so we have to sign a contract with them and get that moving. So, but it is meant to have a, a significant amount of time dedicated to public input this year. Yep. In theory, though, that should precede a big zoning change like this, should it? And we had a, a a very big process on this to develop the the actionable master plan. So there there has been considerable amount of conversation. It's right. it, it isn't just being plucked out of thin air that this is what we wanted to see happen. It had a significant amount of public input um, that we would build into the zoning and build into the new master plan. And that process to me emphasized why we needed to do a master plan because it felt like it was like you know, plugging the hole in the dike because we hadn't done the master plan. So you have community members showing up saying, let's put a school here. Let's, you know, good master planning conversations. Uh, but because it's we hadn't done it. Chick yeah, chicken and it's a chicken and egg. Um, yeah. it, it could be argued the other way that, you know, it's like, well, how can, how can we do the big, big picture without looking at the details? Um, and then, I think we could, it could go either way. An actual master plan, just to say it again, because it is, I mean, you're running with it like that's the approved plan. But I do remember the conversation with Stephanie Clark was, this is kind of an advisory concept plan. Just, and that's why we changed the name. So it's not a master plan for the Country Club Road property. I think it needs to be reviewed. And certainly I don't think it needs, should be built the way it's drawn. And when we went through the process, we were told yep. they wouldn't, that that's not a master plan that's set in concrete. Yep. Uh, but if you're proceeding yep. that way, I'm troubled. Okay. If we're going through the, right now, the, the I'm following the process as it's, as it is still the official process, which is that we're moving forward with that type of process. And as I said, when, if, if and when it changes, then that's how we would adjust. So when do we get a chance to discuss and change it? Then is that going to come up? The so I mean the Country Club Road project that piece of it um, you know the work plan for that we've we've wanted to be able to get that in front of you guys the budget's been a big process so we put that off till February so we are going to meet and talk about the the plan to talk about really how this process works to develop the Country Club Road site now that we know what the public in general wants. Um, those big picture questions have been answered. It's not all single family homes or it's not, you know, there've been a lot of big questions that have been answered as to what we would expect to see at the site, including, you know, a, a lot of development up to 200, 250 housing units in the lower area, buildings up to five stories. We don't know what they're gonna look like. We don't know how they're gonna be laid out. That's correct. But we have a general idea and we can start then going to, um, what we'll talk about at the next meeting really is having in what's called an RFI request for uh, interest. And we would um, start to pull together. So we might need to spend some money, which we'll talk about from the fund to have White and Burke be able to help us put together an RFI because they're the ones who are familiar with how we write these things to get developer interest developers. We would then bring the RFI to you. You would approve the RFI we would then go through and put that out and see what the developer interest is. And then they would just come in with, with ideas of where they're going and you would eventually pick a developer who's going to be our partner. The developer would then start to take those next steps of this is how we would envision developing this. And we would eventually work towards having a, a development agreement that would go through and say, yeah, if you're gonna build that, we can get enough increment using TIF and on a separate path, we need our zoning change. We can't do a growth center designation until we change the zoning. Mm -hmm. So we have to change the zoning in order to allow us to do a growth center application, which would then enable us to use TIF. And TIF is how we would build all the infrastructure for this project. It will cost no tax dollars because, and it has to go through a lot of reviews to go through that process. So that's how we would build the infrastructure is using TIF funds, but we need a development agreement and 
the developer would agree to build certain things in certain ways. They're going to then handle the costs of all the engineering because it's their buildings. It's not our buildings. It's their buildings. So they'll do the engineering. They, they take over those costs. They're, what they get out of it is all the new infrastructure is all being built by the city at our cost because we're bonding for that infrastructure. They get the land presumably for a dollar because we're working as a partnership on that. And so you end up building a relationship of what this what this would look like. They're doing all the work. They're putting in the capital on their end. Um, but we need a development agreement. And Stephanie and um, and we and the planning department can go through and explain a lot more of the details when we start getting through that. There's so many assumptions here we haven't talked about. That's next week's agenda. That is exactly what next week's agenda is. Yeah, that is, is exactly yeah. what it is. It because is, but actually, you know, it, it just you talk about it like an experienced developer, but you're not. I've uh, all right, just just for putting it on the table. Yeah. I worked for the I worked for the city of Barry. I know. For, and in the city of Barry, we had um, issues that were going on on Main Street during the big dig. And one point we wanted to try to do was to clean up some of North Main Street in Barry. And so the city, um, we proposed out of the planning office that we should work to purchase what was the old Wayland Strug building. It was burned down and an apartment in back. We would buy them, we would tear them down, we would prep the site, and we got grants to do that. We then put out to bid the redevelopment of the site. The city negotiated to have uh, the state take two floors. We received three bids. We took DEW, and DEW built an 80,000 square foot building. Um, it required a TIF because we had to go through and provide all the parking and all the infrastructure and the brownfield work. And we did all that. City assumed all those costs and the developer did all the development and that's how it worked out. Um, so yes, I have done these before. I am not a developer, I'm a city planner, but I've worked with developers and this is the process that we use. If we wanna do it, I can help the city go through this process here. If the city chooses not to, that's not my not my choice. If if the decision is the board would rather sell the property or move on or do something different or keep it as a big park, that's that's not my decision to make. But I do have experience on these types of projects and I do know how to move them along. I was I was in Barry for five years. We did that project, that whole project in three. These projects can be done efficiently, they can be done effectively, but they have to be set up and organized and run in that way. And and during that time was, you know, the Great Recession. We had a flood in 2011. So we certainly had our handful of, of distractions and other things. So um, I do want to make sure that you are aware. This, this isn't just me running ideas and just hoping and guessing it works. It, I have done these before and they have worked, whether it's that one, whether it's Enterprise Alley um, or other projects that we've had. So, but the zoning. <laughs> right. So, so, right, that is, the, that is the exact agenda item for next week is to lay this out and make sure, have the council ask questions and approve what you want to approve and not approve what you don't want to. That is exactly what we're getting ahead of ourselves other than Part of one of the things we have to do is change the zoning, which is related to that, which is, again, this is a preview of what's coming for the zoning public hearing next week to kind of make sure you have an advanced notice of what's what's coming so that it's not out of the blue. And when you say, when you say next, next, next meeting, next meeting I'm sorry, it's, not, it's actually a couple weeks. getting old, though. No, no, no. Right. It's, I, yeah, that's what I'm just saying. It's February 14th, actually. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, the four, it's the 14th. I'm not coming back next week. Valentine's Day. Yeah. Valentine's Day, right? What could be better? Okay. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in process, the kind of process yeah. thing that we were talking about. Yeah. So, less process, but just like going into the February 14th meeting. Like, so I know that there's a lot of conversations happening right now in the legislature about like river corridor regulations and, you know, like a Home Act 2 and stuff. And maybe it's just we have to wait and see what they do and then but i guess like are you following those does it seem like there's any potential 
conflicts with anything that we're doing with what the legislature's working on. Obviously, we don't know what they're going to pass at this point, but I think some of it we have a decent idea probably of at least like the direction they're headed and just just making sure that that's all like being monitored so that we're not going to have to come back and undo things in a few months and just, just trying to be efficient. <laughs> yeah, we, we do. I, I do try to keep track of them. I haven't been keeping track of these current ones. The only one I've been working on is with Bill for the, um, for the residents, um, for their, their funding to help elevate houses. So I really haven't been paying atta- attention to home act two. These change so much. I usually wait till after town meeting day to really start digging in because they're going to change a bunch before, no sense reading a hundred page pr- proposal that's going to change in two weeks. So anybody else? Okay. We get to spend more, plenty more time talking to you about this, Mike. I, I appreciate this. Yes. Um, See you on Valentine's day. Yes. <laughs> and I think we are ready to, move on i don't think we have anything under other business so we can move to city council reports let's start at your end lauren sure just a couple quick things um one it's come up a little bit tonight but just um am appreciative of the progress at the state house on some potential funding for um impacted communities like montpelier and i'm just including um, residents. So um, glad to see that and grateful that we've got the capacity to be tracking. And I know our mayor and city manager and other staff have been spending a lot of time up there. So just thanks to everyone on the team for the effort going into that. Obviously, really important stuff. And our um, House and Senate delegation have been doing a lot of leadership um, representing us in the State House, too. So thank them. Uh, Wanted to mention... um, One more time, the um, Commission on Recovery and Resilience is doing a public forum February 15th, 630 to 830 at the Montpelier High School. Uh, So it'll be a great chance to hear uh, what that group's been working on and weigh in on the um, priorities that have started gelling, make sure that that commission seems to be on the right track and um, looking at some good projects. So hope people can make that. Um, And as it came up earlier, that uh, commission is hiring an executive director. So um, please check out MontpelierStrong.org if you are interested in moving forward some great resilience projects and consider applying. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. Ellen. Um, I just want to thank all the city staff um, for their hard work for, uh, during the budget process. And I don't have anything else to report. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I guess just whatever it comes up, I guess for the, I'd love to, do we do a recap in the budget process or look at the process for the future? We certainly could. I don't know about the rest of you, but I didn't think it was that's not an easy thing to work through. Uh-huh. And it feels like maybe we can improve um, how we approach this. You're certainly right that it was not an easy thing to work through. There yeah. are some years where there's a lot of agreement and the, budget, the challenges are not as bad and it goes more easily, you know, when that happens. But, but yeah, I, I think I'd be fine to, uh, I'd like again, to. some, sometime after town meeting to look into that, uh, uh, Sal. Um, yeah, I, I, um, greatly appreciate all the work that the staff did, uh, to help us get through this. It was certainly a learning experience to do the budget for the first time. Um, it was tough, and I, I think the next couple of years are going to be tough as well. So a good practice. Um, I, I like what I hear about some of the some of the things we're implementing to, to try and um, mitigate some of the issues we've come up with. Um, I, I just think it's going to be a couple of tough years, and um, I'm hoping that uh, maybe things on the revenue side help a little bit as um, the city starts to recover from um, getting whacked a couple of couple of times in the last twelve months. Um, so that's it. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Carrie. Yeah, I'll just echo other folks and say thank you so much to the staff. Um, we we asked an awful lot of you throughout this process, and you came through, and I really appreciate it. Um, this is this has been really tough, and 
I am, I, I'm eager to talk about ways to improve this process in the future for next time we do it. Yeah. And that's all. Thank you. Donna. Uh, yes. Again, thank the staff and thank the council members for digging in. And maybe one of the problems with, to me, we've been talking numbers since March because we had so many new council members and they would ask questions about budgetary stuff or the money behind things. So I feel like we really talked about our budget, but perhaps we have to set ourselves, the council, a better deadline. So we become more assertive sooner. And then we have longer time to consider some of the different ideas. So I think it's good to look at that process and start analyzing it better. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Donna. A couple of things. Uh, one, as everyone else says, thank you to the staff. You know, one of the things that uh, makes our city uh, as great a place to live as it is, is that we have such a professional and dedicated and competent staff on every department, every uh, every aspect of city government. And so we have the capacity to deal with the complicated kind of things that we're doing today. Uh, same thing with city council. Um, nobody was slacking off. Everybody was really doing the work to get, to, to understand all the issues of the budget, which is not easy, especially the first time through. And so I appreciate all the work that everybody's done. Um, on the uh, on the monetary side, I uh, can let you know that uh, yesterday I got a email from uh, Senator Cummings talking about some of the fl flood relief stuff, and she told me that the she was anticipating the tax abatement bill to pass out of the Senate today, which I wasn't there this afternoon to know what happened, but it was uh, to you know soften the blow of uh, on towns for uh, tax abatement issues. And there's also money in the Budget Adjustment Act for flood relief. Our delegation is gonna continue working to find more money uh, for us and other city of cities affected in in the budget, and so it's encouraging news to get uh, to get this kind of thing uh, moving this early in the session is is really uh, really going to help us a lot. And that's it for me, city clerk's report. Just pass and say see you all tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, board board of allotment members, uh, tomorrow night at the uh, senior center. Thanks, sir. And city manager's report. Thank you. I I do have a couple of things. I'll try not to keep you too long. Uh, except people have mentioned, but um, we are following the legislator. We'll try to get a write up in the report. But there was fifteen million dollars, ten from the general fund, and five from ARPA. Uh, improved in the Budget Adjustment Act for aid to municipalities. Uh, that included both lost revenue and some aid to individuals. Um, the Ed Tax Abatement did move through the Senate um, and has passed out of House Ways and Means. Uh, the governor has proposed uh, that the state cover the FEMA, the local share of FEMA contributions. So that's like eight hundred some one thousand dollars for us in the future. Uh, he also put in a fair amount of money for resiliency and buyouts. $39 million or something like that. So there may be funds available for those kind of things. Um, so we're trying to, we're tracking all of that so far. It's all been good. Um, we don't know, you know, how much we will get and when we will get it, but it seems like there will be something substantial, you know, substantive, I should say, coming to the city uh, for flood revenue relief. That will certainly make a big difference in this current budget, but we don't know. So until we know, um, you know, we sent you out a memo just letting you know we're continuing to track uh, current situations in the budget and, uh, you know, good and bad, um, best and worst situations. I think we are going to come forward at some point future about um, possibly setting aside, putting in reserve uh, funds to pay off the national life so that we have it, we've reserved it, it's there instead of it being a sort of hanging over our heads. Um, 
we're continuing holding our vacancies strategically. Not so it's not 100 percent, but as we see vacancies, we're continuing to try to keep them open, and it does have impact. But this is we're also in a tough year. Uh, we already talked about the DPW overnight shift. Um, that's a, that's an experiment. We'll see how that works. Police have uh, on their own been voluntarily adjusting shifts. They're extended time that they'll have one dispatcher on duty. So that's good. It saves us money, but it's really not great for emergency response to only have one dispatcher if something really bad goes on. Uh, and they have been making other changes to their own shifts, the, the officer shifts, like um, instead of just following their normal schedule, if they know their schedule for court, they've been trading with people so they can come into their shift, do their court, not at overtime. So they are they are making great strides. Um, so, like I said, we're following the state progress because that has a big difference. Said so we'll have a recommendation, and uh, we're really trying to see where we are as of March one. Um, because if we have to make more drastic decisions, you know, we'll have till June thirty to capture. So every the longer we wait, the more the less time we have to squeeze in more money. If if you you know what I mean. So. Um, we're, we're watching it really carefully. Um, so that's where that is. Um, a reminder that the next week and thereafter, we will have a much smaller room in here. Our next week, I keep saying next week, our next meeting in three weeks, um, those will be closed. So it'll only be this half of the room. CJC will be taking up the other space in there. So if we think we're going to have a a really large crowd we might want to think about if there's an issue or if we have one one week like say we get a big turnout for the zoning the second meeting we might want to consider relocating somewhere so just mention that um so we have at the next meeting i'll try not to say next week we have the country club world discussion and the zoning public hearings um my review we had tentatively penciled in the, the discussion on the short-term rentals for after budget but I don't think we've made a commitment. So that's really up to you. Do you want to push that till after a town meeting? Um, then make the yeah, next couple so. of meetings a little more bearable. Yeah. Okay. That's what yeah. I thought, but I didn't want to. So. Even without it, there's plenty I mean, to right. talk no, about. No, I get that, but that's just one more thing. That's, you know, right. I think, I think the country club road and zoning and managers review are three pretty substantive topics. So, and with that, um, the mayor and Mary have sent out their reviews of their things. So please get them in and let me have it. And uh, I just want to echo, um, first of all, I appreciate your comments about the staff and our staff really did great and they continually are doing great to try to make this work. I also want to commend you all. You did do some hard work and, um, you know, it's kind of, I uh, was talking to Tim, but you know, we've, I've worked with divided councils and I mean divided on votes, but um you all continue to be cordial to each other. You continue, you know, I mean, you're doing it in the spirit of the way it's supposed to be done. So you don't agree, you don't agree at all. Then you just move forward onto the next item. And so, you know, we can all live with seeing how it comes, but the, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you're, you're doing government right by deliberating and voting and not having group think you're, you're kicking things around. So it's hard. And I appreciate the, the, the approach that you've all taken with one another, it's, it makes it easy to work for you and with you. So thanks for that. Now I'm done. Thanks, Bill. And with that, and without objection, we are adjourned at 10.04 p.m. Thanks, everybody.